everybody what's up it's kurt it's the arborist blueprint podcast we got sean stern for part three in the waiting room let's let him in come on sean there he is <laughs> oh, 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 oh hey hello 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 how's it going i got you uh going good oh i love nice. the, the salmon uh, arbor canada t-shirt today <laughs> yep mix up the colors a little bit you're always mm -hmm. looking good i do my best for you buddy <laughs> perfect so how are things? Yeah, man, good, good, good. Just getting prepped for a big old March coming up here in a couple days, and well, hopefully a big old March. We got a little bit of uh, controversy on one of the jobs, I suppose, but oh. we'll sort that out. So can you allude? No, just a just a uh, a client that I maybe didn't quite communicate appropriately with oh. their internal staff. So whether or not we have a course running. Starting Friday, we'll find out. <laughs> oh, shoot. That one uh, but, you were going to go out east for or something, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. Nice. Along the lines of communication, again, another... 100%. That's where it all stems, eh? 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Never assume anything with communication. Always follow up. But Yeah. 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 That could be, it could be tricky when there's so many moving parts, I guess, with... Uh, totally. Yeah. Different organizers. And then by the time it gets trickles down to the uh, actual instructor, it's like, you're the last to know. 100%. 100%. What kind of I like the new t-shirts. I like the oh, new t-shirts. Yeah, thanks, buddy. If, uh... I saw that floating around at ISAO. I was like, oh, that's a nice t-shirt. Yeah, I got one for you. Mm. Naturally. Of course. Thanks, How buddy. many do I owe you for doing three mega podcasts? <laughs> <laughs> I'm having fun. This is great. This yeah. is good. Oh, I'll How, you been? You How was ISAO? Sure. Tell, me, tell me about it. How was ISAO? ISAO was cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. So my friend doesn't know. I went out to the ISA, the International Society of Boar Culture, Ontario conference. It was the 75th anniversary. So that was really neat because I've never been involved with the ISA like at all up until this point, you know, just running my own tree company five years mm -hmm. by myself, did a little bit with ArbCan, got to know some people through there. And then it's like, hey, I should maybe like think about this ISA thing. I know you and me both were like, I don't know, we don't really need, you know, CEUs and uh, to be accredited with anyone because we kind of run our own thing. Right. So, yep. Yep. But then I kind of got more thinking and I'm like, you know, with this industry and some changes that I kind of want to make and not because it's bad, our industry, but I want to always push the limits and give people new perspectives on things and improve what we can. Of course, that's how evolution kind of works. Uh, I was feeling pulled to the ISA, I guess you'd say. Don't nice. you know, Mr. Hey, I, uh, sorry, that was bad. I was trying to, I, I can't freestyle nothing. <laughs> God. delete edit that out okay um yeah so getting to your actual question of how was it it was it was cool it was like three days of uh this conference so big rooms it was like nice, shoulder to yeah. shoulder in between tons of people coming out for all these talks i originally thought that i could go to all of them so i had like my whole calendar kind of like lined up and then when i got there i realized that there was like they're congruently going on at the same time like three or four different talks yeah. I was like, oh no, I could only catch so many. So there was a lot around like municipal, like planting and planning and some of the problems there. Mm -hmm. There was a few really cool uh, presentations that I loved because uh, they're near and dear to my heart with uh, like fungi and stuff. This lady mm -hmm. named yeah. Jen, I think her Lu Lewin, I forget her last name. I'm sorry, um, but she spoke about fungi and talked about like. Uh, some of the documentaries that I've seen, like uh, Kiss the Ground and um, what's the other one? Fantastic Fungi, like Paul Stamets. So everything yep, about yep. fungi, like they kind of touched on like micro remediation, like filtering the ground and like psychedelics and how that's helping with like PTSD and mental health. And and then it yeah. transitioned into like how it's connected to the trees and all. I'm like, oh, man, I loved it. Oh, and she mentioned this book, uh, Finding the Mother Tree. Really cool book if anyone wants to check that out. Uh, about this lady who worked in like BC forestry and then she was uh, going through the new plantations and wondering why trees weren't growing well and she did all these experiments and looked underground and, and then this is where she discovered this connection with mycorrhizal fungi and uh, what was keeping the forest healthy because they were like spraying like clear cuts to try and keep down like alder and like all these other different species of plants. Sure, yeah. You no know, unintended consequences not knowing it's killing biodiversity and other plants that they all grow together symbiotically in this forest, right? Yeah. So that was a really cool book. And then some of her challenges that she had trying to change that industry and being a female sort of in a male dominant mm, kind mm. of place, you know, 
So really cool book. I highly recommend that. Um, other than that one, um, I met like Chris Estrading and a bunch of people like Katie Tree. She might even uh, check this out and listen. So shout out to you guys. Uh, right on. She Excellent. came from pretty far away. Yeah. I saw Josh, uh, another Arb Can instructor from uh, nice. Diamond Tree or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. How's Josh doing? He was doing good. Yeah. He was pretty happy uh, with what he was with what he's doing in his new position nice. there and stuff. So that's yeah, awesome really to hear. Good. They had a little bit of a booth there. It's all Maple Leaf that's Ropes. Awesome. Uh, all them. They said to say hi. I saw you on a poster. You're like a poster boy now. I know. I know. People <laughs> keep sending me photos like, hey, you're famous. I'm like, <laughs> oh, I don't know I about that. I wasn't the first one. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was no, cool. A couple of people sent me some photos. But, that was uh, good. Arbor Store was there. And if, uh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Arbcan, of course, had a booth. So I was hanging out with Dwayne and uh, Tony. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I saw I saw you boys doing like the mobile podcast thing. That looked kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah, that was Tony. He had this little <laughs> Pelican case, this little tactical tactical unit that he was moving around and uh <laughs> they're doing their little sprouts so the, those guys are on the tree actions podcast if anyone's wondering yeah uh he good talks podcast. about the human really force the human force so i don't even know if they get into trees all that much or if it's just more about kind of you know human connection they get off on all sorts of different topics but yeah i would definitely recommend checking that out as well we're trying to, we're going to try and plan to do a a kind of a collaborative podcast together and then we can both nice release it yeah That'd be awesome. That'd be really cool. Yeah. Oh, and Tony did a, a presentation there at the conference on uh, stoicism for the arborist. Oh, okay. Yeah. I saw I him up presenting. I didn't know what his topic was. That's pretty cool. Yeah, man. They had like all this cool stuff. So, you know, as people get to know me, they're going to realize that I'm, you know, kind of like broad perspective thinking, you know, holistic minded kind of <laughs> kind of person. So I, I love all this kind of stuff and I take little bits of things from everywhere. But like so stoicism is kind of a neat one too. And he was trying to change some of the mindsets, I guess, of people um, as maybe like leaders on their crew and to not react and more respond. So his big thing was like mm-hmm. between between the space of like something, you know, happening and then you reacting to it and getting all upset there's like this moment, this moment where you can make a choice, right? And sort of step back. And in his case, he says he like literally takes a pause and like stops. So yep. like people will actually consider him to be like non-communicative sometimes. You know, something happens because he knows he wants to react or get upset. So he just like puts the brakes on and lets it fizzle out, you know, until he can yeah. regain sort of some control over his emotion and or whatever, I guess, is kind of what he was talking about. And then... Uh, and then come back and, and talk about things, you know, in a more productive kind of way. So, yeah, he had some cool tips there. And there was a lot of a good turnout nice. for that kind of thing. So, That's awesome. Yeah. yeah when, you, when you start to realize that it's human nature to respond, like, emotionally or react emotionally, it unlocks a lot for you. I yeah. mean, it's, it's kind of ingrained in our brains and in our, our beings that when something happens, we react to it. And that's our body has natural reactions, right? We talk fight, fight or flight. We talk about all these natural reactions that we can instigate in our body. But uh, once you recognize that those things happen naturally, you can actually take that pause and kind of say, okay, what mm-hmm. do I need to accomplish here? What is the goal? Let's respond with the training and the experience and the knowledge that I have rather than just react emotionally. And it's, it's pretty powerful. That's cool talk. I'd, I'd like to hear that. That'd be cool. Yeah, definitely. And I like what you said there too. It's uh, you have to understand that it's happening first, right? So Bingo. a lot of yep. these action points that, you know, we could easily throw out there for people. It's like, it depends on where you're at on the scale of awareness, I guess you could call it. Um, if you don't even realize that you are not, your monkey mind of thoughts every day and that there's different quality of thoughts or there's thoughts, you know, coming from different invisible directions, you know, maybe from, you know, not to be too woo woo, but like a higher self that gives you good guidance Mm -hmm. and says, here, you should do this versus like the devil on your shoulder. That's like, no, you should do this over here and like, screw that guy. It's like, you have to be able to like be this like third person, right? Like mind, body, spirit, and then like discern between those thoughts. What's quality? Where do you want, the direction of your life to go? How do you want to handle the situation? But you can't do that unless you're already mindful of it. So that's where like all this yeah. mindfulness and meditation and stuff comes in, right? And it's it can be basic, but it can also be a really advanced tool that you can use all throughout your journey, right? So that's where I usually direct people first if they're kind of new to this kind of stuff. Um, a great book that I read, uh, The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer was like the first thing that mm. I read 
it, of course, everyone's journey is different. But for me, that was a cool book. And I was just like, whoa, I'm not my thoughts. Like I thought I was my thoughts lived in my head all the time. Like that was me. That was it. And not that I'm not religious, nothing like that. But like uh, it kind of gives you this different perspective. And it, it like kind of rattled me. But that provided me some awareness. And then that combined with a little bit of mindfulness and meditation, which is, you know, super basic as far as um, like literally just paying attention to your breath. It, they always talk about your breath. It doesn't have to be your breath, but it's always with it's you, huge. right? And breath, it's huge. Yeah. breath work itself has its own benefits. So paying attention to your breath kind of makes sense. Uh, mm -hmm. But when we're in a little bit of that fight or flight, and fight or flight's not like a black or white thing, it can be like a, uh, a spectrum, of course, like anything. Is a, I think everything's a bit of a gray area. You could have like this little tap, and this is what I had for years of PTSD, it was like this little tiny tap, just slowly on a trickle of, P of uh, fight or flight on all the time. So your, your yeah. heart rate's just slightly elevated. And you know, you're you're kind of shunting the, the circulation from your fingers. And I would like literally get ray nodes and like my fingers would lose circulation really quickly. And I'd be kind of like just sweating just slightly, right? And your heart's just kind of like bounding a little bit. And, mm. and uh, you don't realize that until you can really sort of settle your mind so that it takes practice thinking about your breath. And people say it's really hard to meditate. And I agree, it is difficult, but um, it doesn't have to be. Like you can just sit, observe your breath and then the whole point of it is that when you realize your thoughts come in and your mind's going to wander, that's, that's what's supposed to happen, right? Your mind wanders and then you realize you're sitting there daydreaming about some, some ridiculous f fantasy bullshit, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, so as soon as you recognize that, that's, that's what you need to do. That's what makes the changes, is that recognition of like, oh, I'm, I'm thinking. So now you've just noticed that you were having a thought. You, you had a thought that you were having a thought. And then you're like, whoa, all of a sudden you kind of one day have this realization that there's layers. I'm watching my thought, but who's watching my thought? Like if I'm having a thought, who's watching it? Sure. And then you're like, whoa, this kind of goes deep, right? Like, <laughs> like where do these layers end? Which spoiler alert, they don't, it's infinite. But um, you can step back yeah. almost like watching a movie. You're in the movie and then all of a sudden, whoa, you realize, oh yeah, I'm in a theater. I'm watching a movie. I'm not like in the movie, but your mind gets so consumed. Mm -hmm. and, and just like in day-to-day -day life, it gets consumed by these things. So yeah, practicing basic meditation, I think is huge, at least to make that first step to uh, recognizing what's going on in your body, how your physiological uh, responses and feelings are attached to those thoughts as well. You know, whether mm -hmm. you get mm -hmm. those feelings I was talking about before, feelings in your chest or energy throughout your body, whatever it might be. And then you can discern and then, you know, make changes from there. I don't know if you yeah, agree with 100%. all of that, but no, for sure. I mean, it's 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 something that uh, it's you know I'm I'm no kind of expert in meditation or anything like that, but uh, I do I do agree with you completely in in some of the meditative practices and some of the benefits that can bring you both kind of internally and externally with how you see things around you. Uh, and I think honestly, the biggest thing for me is just that breath work, like you were talking about. It's those those basic breathing patterns and focusing on your breathing and really paying attention to how you're breathing and where the air is moving in and out and how your body is, you know, coordinating these processes. And it's it kind of started there for me, and then you can kind of expand on it. But uh, there's all sorts of, and I, I can send you some stuff if you wanted to throw it out there, um, but there's all sorts of like research papers on breath work okay. and how that affects you metabolically, mm. meditatively, all these types of things, uh, different breathing patterns that you can experiment with. Uh, and it's kind of interesting because, I mean, you come from a fire service background as well, and to totally diverge off of our boric culture completely, uh, when we talk in the fire service about conservation of breath right air conservation air preservation we're breathing on these self-contained breathing apparatus that have a very limited timeline to them yeah and inevitably you know it's there's <laughs> you hope it never happens but there's there's potentially going to be a time when you get trapped in a building or trapped in some sort of you know immediately dangerous to life and health ideal H environment and you need to make that tank last as long as you can while help is coming in to get you and so we practice these breathing techniques that both slow your breathing rate down, but increase the actual oxygenation of your blood 
And most importantly, it gets you focused on something. It's that meditative state so that you're not letting your mind wander to, oh my goodness, what happens here? What's mm -hmm. about this? My kids at home, all this type of stuff. You're very focused on what you're doing in the moment and it calms your brain down. Uh, and I never attributed the two of them. And then I started to read a couple of research papers and the main breath technique we teach in the fire service is actually the number one researched breath technique for achieving a meditative state and, and metabolic conditioning and all these types of things. It's like, oh, of course, it, like, we it just know makes now. sense. It's called skip breathing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, you basically take a breath in until your lungs are full. You pause for that split moment and take another little breath in and it really opens up your diaphragm and it really allows the oxygenation to occur in the lungs. Uh, and then it's just a slow exhale through pursed lips or duck lips. I always tell people to do duck lips because you're in this SCBA <laughs> mask. Nobody can see you doing your like your little duck lips. But anyway, there you go. Yeah. So, yeah. Totally I agree. agree with you. That's a, it's a really cool rabbit hole to go down. So, I mean, applying that to a board culture in case people, someone's like, well, what does that have to do with contract climbing? <laughs> well, <Yeah. laughs> you can control your emotions and not get upset and allow 100%. when you're in a tree, um, the stress of maybe not knowing what to do or being in a sketchy environment or you're in a storm or it's windy or whatever it mm -hmm. might be. You mm -hmm. can take control of these, you know, quote, stressful situations through a variety of these techniques and like you said, skip breathing uh, can be, which kind of sounds similar to some other breathing methods. And I don't think it, you know, maybe really matters exactly what you do. It'd be really cool to check out some of these studies to, to see how, if some work better for other people. But I think if you know and feel like it resonates with you, that's what's most important. Like you don't need a study to tell you which one to do, but definitely start there if you're an analytical person. And uh, Tony talked about this too in his uh, presentation was doing like a, a four square kind of breathing or like a yep. tactical breathing. And I mm -hmm. like how they call it tactical breathing because all of a sudden it kind of like these macho, I don't have feelings, I don't cry, you know, type uh, behaviors that we all seem to possess from generations before us, you know, not being allowed to cry and express our emotion. It sounds kind of cool. So it's like, okay, I, I can do tactical breathing. No big deal. Totally. Yeah. No big deal. So, it sounds awesome. It sounds manly. Yeah. <laughs> but the correlation between a lot of these different uh, breathing methods, it seems, is being conscious that you are breathing, taking some... Mm -hmm. um, voluntarily control over it and your exhale is a lot longer than your inhale and that seems to bring on some of that parasympathetic which is the opposite of sympathetic which is your fight or flight so it kind of brings on that system in your body to help calm things down and regulate all these hormones and chemicals and whatever floating through your body to level you out because and why that's important you know, I'm not a doctor either. So by the way, <laughs> this isn't medical advice. No. <laughs> not that you have to be a doctor to be smart about what stuff is. But anyways, <laughs> I digress. Okay. So when you have the fight or flight going on, they say, you know, when people say like you flipped your lid, someone flips mm -hmm. their lid, they freak out. That's like literally what happens. That prefrontal cortex like disengages, I guess, or whatever. Or is it engages? One of the two. Yeah. Something about either it's it's either all prefrontal cortex or it's not. I can't remember, but that's like the physiological response of the uh, of the brain. So you're not using like the full spectrum of your brain to actually be a, no. to provide like rational feedback to yourself or to other people. You're just you're just reacting through like survival instinct emotion of like mm -hmm. ah my boundary was crossed anger. Yeah, it's you know, the animalistic it's like, side of your brain. Yeah, right? it's the survival yep. part of it, yep. right? So and yep. that's been ingrained in like our subconscious from like years and years and years of conditioning. So that's why they call these like journeys because like to unravel all of this mindset and process like could, could take a long time, man. Like I'm, I've been on this journey for a while. I made some huge shifts. It's insane. I almost yeah. feel like a different person every week lately, but uh, it does take a lot of work, but you can see some pretty big shifts and improvements right away in the beginning of a journey. So absolutely. Yeah. If anyone wants uh, more info with that kind of stuff, you know, maybe they're struggling with anything. I'm I'm open to to anybody who wants to reach out. I'm here. I don't I don't want to push any of this on on anybody, but I think a podcast is a pretty non-invasive place to talk about personal development, and mindset, or uh, mm -hmm. dealing with stress or PTSD or whatever it might be. Because uh, people can choose to listen or they can choose to shut it off. You know, I'm not shoving it down your throat in that sense. But if anyone uh, wants to explore that further or reach out to me, I'm here and happy to help and try and get you some resources, get you on your way because. It doesn't yeah. have to all be treated with Western, in my opinion, Band-Aid fixes with, with medication um, yeah. or that kind yeah. of thing. 
I mean, I think they have their uses. And of course, like I said, nothing's black and white out there. And in very acute situations where you're having some major physiological reactions to something, maybe you had something traumatic happen to you, that could it could be normal to have those responses for a few months afterwards. Mm -hmm. And yep. you may need medication to help you get rid of some of those highs and lows to keep you centered. But ultimately, you don't want to be on those forever, in my opinion. You want to find coping strategies and find the root of the problem. So like relating it to tree health, I mean, if a tree is sick and has a bug on it, there's a problem there. But what's the problem? Mm -hmm. let's, not, let's not always fix it with an, a chemical, an herbicide or a pesticide, because that's going to have a whole bunch of other unintended consequences, like killing the biodiversity in the ground, and the, the pest is going to come back. Like The pest is there for a reason. So if we can fix the root problem, like emotionally in ourselves or in a tree, then all of a sudden when you fix that root, it just manifests into this correction of a whole bunch of things above the ground. At least I've noticed, yeah. like yeah. with addictions and all sorts of other problems, I fixed some, some root core things, basically some perspective shifts from like when I was a child and that kind of thing. And that just turned into fixing all of these issues that I have day to day now without even knowing exactly, you know, does that kind of make sense? Like what they were like, 100%, yeah. I'm not putting the spray on there. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think it's, it's that self-reflection is so important, right? And it's, it's, I like the word that you use there about perspective. Uh, and that's literally what it comes down to. It's, it's the ability to self-reflect and to realize that things that have you've done or things that you're doing or reactions that you're having are about perspective. And it's about perspective based on the knowledge and the exposure that you're given at that moment. So, you know, hindsight 2020, pretty common saying, you can look back on things now and say, well, you know, I regret that decision or I, I don't, you know, I should have made a different call there. But the reality is you made the call based on the information you had and you now have a different perspective. So the ability to self-reflect and recognize that uh, I think is pretty critical. And, and to kind of build on your point, and again, no medical scientist here, like neither of us are doctors. We're not, you know, don't come to us for recommendation. Uh, but in my kind of exposure through emergency services and through a lot of the stuff that, that you've been a part of, and, and, you know, I haven't walked the journey that you have, but I've, I've seen people walk it and I've had my own issues over the years. Uh, and to me, where I think Western medicine falls short is, is finding the root. I, th I think Western medicine is great for the acute, you know, we have a problem, we need to have a fix right this moment. Mm -hmm. I think it's great for that. Um, but I think you're right. I think it's, it's long term. I have not seen great success being, you know, following medicative practices and all these types of things for long periods of time personally. Um, so yeah, I totally agree with you uh, in all that. For sure. Yeah, for sure. it's challenging. It's so many rabbit holes to go down there and, yeah, and speculate yeah. on. But I like your thing about perspective is something that I've been like contemplating a lot lately. I contemplate mm. stuff all the time. <laughs> it's just my, it's in my jam. I think it's it's, it's how I heal it's too. A good, but, it's a good practice. But it's a uh, good practice. That is a big core, I think, key to making advances in mm -hmm. within yourself ultimately, which is the the ultimate thing: changing yourself and how you think. But this all translates, by the way, into into business and to all that kind of stuff. And that is what I attribute a lot of my success to with business or anything that people might perceive as being a positive in me. Like maybe yeah. they're like, wow, that guy can talk on a podcast. Well, you know what? I always, I couldn't always, you know, I couldn't sit there without being nervous or, uh, totally. and I still do get nervous, you know, and, yep. uh, but to be authentic, you know, and like say when we go through that trainer program with Arboriculture Canada, whatever, to get over all those things, which translate amazing into business, I had to do a lot of self work in order to get there. So again, that's fixing the root. And then it manifests into mm -hmm. this great thing where you can walk around and no one can mess with you. No one can piss you off. You don't have these attachments to like, that guy gave me a bad look. I don't think he likes what I did with his trees today or this employee that I have. I think he's, he's going to quit. He's going to do something. I don't know. And you build these stories up in your head and it's just like, totally. It's like you're torturing yourself. Like you're creating yeah. all those stories in your in your mind based on almost nothing. Assumptions, Bingo. lack of communication, exactly. all these things yep. again. Yep. So it's like, why? Why not just you be yourself in the moment and just yeah. and cut those ties and not be attached yeah. to it? And all of these things get you there. So, yep. yeah, it's 100%. crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, I was having this conversation with a friend of mine just the other day uh, about this concept of, 
you know, why worry about the things that you can't control, right? Mm -hmm. Things are going to happen. They're, they're pre, whether they're predestined, you know, that's a whole other rabbit hole we can go down. But this event is in motion. It's happening. You can't affect the outcome by worrying about it. So why worry, Mm -hmm. right? Just let it unfold and, you know, respond to the new input that you're given. And, uh, it's funny because I, I, we're having this conversation. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that was from Kung Fu Panda. Isn't that like <laughs> Master Ugwe, like the turtle? And so we started to Google like Master Ugwe quotes. Uh, but there's a good one about a peach tree to kind of bring it all back to trees. Oh, yeah. Right? You plant the seed and you water it and you nurture it. And you may want it to be an apple tree. You may want it to be an orange. You may want it to be some other type of tree. But it's going to be a peach tree. Like, that's just it's the reality just, of it right that's what so it just is to good or bad accept accept what you have in front of you and and learn to kind of adapt and respond to what you have so yeah yeah that takes it takes a lot of practice and takes a little bit of like faith i guess in the fact that you need to kind of change your belief a little bit and uh that can be difficult for some people and not may not yep. be the path for everyone but i personally as well has found a lot of uh, reassurance and security and like strength in believing that there is kind of like a bit of a purpose. I still mm-hmm. believe we have free will and we can decide and do whatever the heck we want, good 100%. or bad. Literally, yeah. you can manifest to be a cold, hard criminal or the most loving person in the world. You can do what you want. I think whatever, the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, I don't know. Again, I'm not religious, so don't run away if I say the word God, but people use that term. Okay, yep. so yep. whatever that you think if you think you have a path that's kind of laid out for you then uh it's nice to just kind of almost like take things that happen to you and i mean of course you want to get away from blaming but you can kind of put it in that basket you know what i mean like oh this happened but like oh it happened for a reason so i'll just i'll just sort of blame it on that it happened for a reason and then you don't have this emotional attachment to it right and then you kind of realize that like all of the progress you've ever made in your life anything you know now who you are right now has happened as a result of your past. And most importantly, it's happened as a result from all of those negative things that have happened to you. Like life isn't meant to be like a point A to point B perfect path if you do it right. It's meant to be like windy, turny, bumps in the road, things are gonna squash you along the way, right? That's how it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. You're you're supposed to get thrown these curveballs. And uh, ultimately it's, it's what you do with those situations uh, is how you learn, right? And how you grow. So if you get a major setback, and by the way, the greater the setback, the greater the emotional distress you have from these moments, the greater the uh, progress you will make afterwards and the greater the lesson there is to learn. Mm-hmm. And I believe mm-hmm. like the universe isn't going to throw you something that you can't handle. So there is everything you should be able to handle. And uh, yeah. again, yeah. you need to find different ways to do that. And then you take those tools that you learned from that experience and then you can apply them and build upon them in the future. And they just like level up, level up, level up before, you know, mm-hmm. you're just like taking over the world, <laughs> giving everybody just hugs. like, just like you brother, just like you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's cool. I mean, it's, it's when you talk about, um, you know, purpose and, and I completely agree. I think we all have a purpose in life and, and something that we're meant to fulfill. Uh, Neil actually, and I don't want to steal his, his, thunder but uh, you know I I have a lot of long conversations with Neil Uh, he kind of shared an interesting perspective with regards to purpose uh, and where we kind of shine our light as we move through uh, the world so I'll I'll, I'll leave it there because I don't want to steal his thunder but good conversation if you ever get the chance to chat with Neil ask him about the light and the Polaroid and and light man it's it's deep it's deep for sure Uh, I'm I'm gonna write that down yeah, man. Yeah, it adds a lot of perspective to things, uh, especially when you talk about purpose and where you're going to focus on in your life. It's pretty, yeah, it's a good conversation yeah. to have. Perspective is such a huge thing. And I feel like yeah. as you go through all these moments and you learn all of these things, it just adds another perspective. And this is like a big insight I had actually just recently was I always thought that there was like old Kurt, right? Like, you know, mm. in my head, asleep, Kurt, just moving, reacting to everything that's happening around me, putting blame on everyone else, judging everyone else. And I'm not saying I'm perfect that I don't do these things anymore, but that's who I was then. And then I thought you moved through this transitional scale from like point A to point B uh, as kind of like a new person each time, which you sort of do. But I kind of was thinking, well, what about the past and all of those things? Like now I can't relate to the to other people that may be 
might be there and haven't learned these lessons yet and whatever. And it's like, oh no, I realized you just build upon what you've already have, you know? So like, say you start out in the center of a sphere and that's your perspective of, of reality. And then you start to spread out through this like spider web out, but then you just kind of like all of a sudden get these other dots within the sphere and on the outside of the sphere looking in and then they all kind of start to connect and you build this whole like matrix of experience and perspective like through and i mean perspective of like your own life your past how you see the future but like also through other people's eyes and i think that's mm -hmm, a huge mm -hmm. um tool that people can use is if you try to start to think about how other people think and what what life is like for them and why it's like that you know so if someone gets upset with you or uh you know like you're on your phone at the restaurant and someone like tells you off clearly they're pissed off about something they get off your phone and you have this little you know you want to have this confrontation but i don't know at least i find a lot of comfort now in thinking like i don't know where that person came from i don't know they're they're probably upset about something else already they're like high stress level whatever and it's like and they don't mean to i believe honestly everyone does everything with great intention but they have different limitations from different experiences in the past and they're doing their best you know and yeah. their best might be yelling at you for something that you've done or that they want to take that stress and put it on to you and blame you but if you have that perspective of where they're coming from or that you understand some of this human behavior and that's how people act then you don't have this attachment to it then you don't react you're like mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. you can just kind Bingo. of yep be neutral towards it and like let it go and then carry on with your day and almost like have compassion for that person in a way it's like it's yeah it's tricky to get to that point but but like you can you can have compassion for these people and then all of a sudden you have like this force field around you because of that because they can't mm, mess with mm -hmm. you and then this all snowballs and then all of a sudden you realize you're not even getting in these situations anymore you know when you get around these people in your life that come in and out and they're like they're just like love and light, like the look on their face, their body language is just like, man, yeah. that is like, I don't know what it is about that person, but that is like a kind hearted person. You're just kind of attracted to them. You just want to be around them. You know, they don't get in those situations often where they're getting <laughs> yelled at and like, it's preventative. You totally. Know? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So it, yeah, it just snowballs in such a good direction. Mm -hmm. I think once yeah, you get on this I path. Think it's you know, with, with that concept of compassion and having compassion or empathy for others around you. Uh, and we've all heard it. Uh, and I couldn't even begin to guess where the origin of it comes. Uh, but it's this concept of putting yourself in someone else's shoes, right? Yeah. See the world from their eyes and everybody is fighting a battle that you know nothing about. Yeah. And it's, it's, that is exactly what you're speaking to. I mean, everybody has their own inputs and their own challenges and their own stressors in their life. And at that moment, you know, the pebbles in the backpack got a little too much and that was the outlet that occurred. Uh, and recognizing that, you know, they're fighting the battle that you know nothing about, have some compassion for you and unearth for them rather, and understand that they're not mad at you. This is just the outlet for whatever other stressor is going on in their lives, yeah. uh, it can go a long way. It can go a long way to communication and, and, you know, repairing relationships or whatever that kind of stuff might be. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and just Critical. to wrap this up before we go here into yeah. some more actionable, you know, rational thinking with contract <laughs> climbing and how this can all tie in. Um, you got to be gentle with yourself as well. So if you start doing this kind of stuff, and you do react. You're starting out on this journey and you're like starting to notice these things and you like get in the car and drive away from some sort of a situation. You're like, man, I'm so angry at that person, whatever. And that's like, shit. I mean, shoot. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have done that. I made a, an ass of myself. Uh, you know, I did something in front of my kids or, or whatever it might be as terrible as it might be. It's in the past now, even if it just happened, you cannot change it right now is all that exists. Give yourself like a freaking virtual hug, whatever you got to do, like let yourself have these emotions. So like anger, frustration, guilt, shame, all those things exist and we're meant to experience them. So let yourself experience them. Just yeah. notice them. Bingo. That's all you got to do. Just notice it as if you're the guy in the movie theater watching it on a screen as best you can. Let it happen for as long as it needs to happen. Maybe incorporate some tools like the breath work, whatever to try and you know, actually get yourself 
out of that frame of mind, you know, separate yourself, you know, use that space like Tony talked about in his talk, that space between, yeah. you know, get to that space, whatever you got to do, but then find a way to forgive yourself and not remain attached to the fact that you're upset with yourself for having those emotions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Give yourself some forgiveness yeah. and, and have some grace for yourself. You, yep. It was okay. And that, you know, you're going to try harder the next time because we're all doing the absolute best that we can in the moment with the tools that we have up until that moment. Bingo. And you, of course, look back even five minutes ago and you're like, I should not have done that. I should not have done that. But guess what? You did the best you could at that yeah. time. Now you have you five have a new minutes tool. more information available to you that you yeah. didn't have back if then. If you could 100%. rewind, maybe you wouldn't, but you can't. So now, yep. now you have a new tool. Now you have another experience that you can play on. And what you choose to do with that experience moving forward is, is up to you, right? And mm-hmm, I'm sure you'll mm-hmm. do the best that you can because that's how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, your hopefully comment, everyone enjoyed that. Your comment about children. Yeah, your <laughs> comment about children. Aren't they just like the most crystal clear Ooh. mirror as to who you are as a person? Children are meant to test you for sure. Like talk, well, talking about road rage and stuff like that, it's <laughs> like we're driving the other day and somebody cuts me off. And yeah. my four-year-old, she's like, what an a-hole, daddy. And I'm like, <laughs> what? And, I'm, and you start to realize like. I probably say that every hmm. time somebody cuts us off and she's just picking up on it. Like, yeah. Oh. And you didn't even, don't even realize, Hey, totally. it's like, what and, a crystal clear mirror to see yourself in. <laughs> oh yeah. Children are great for that. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, you know, I think they're there to test us, man. I don't know. Sometimes I have, they feel like I got things under control and then it's just like, holy man, got, I got a 10 yeah. year old girl and it's like hormones are coming, you know, whatever. Like when they get hangry, it's like the end of the world, right? And then yeah, it's just yeah. it's just a constant test on me. Like, how am I going to handle this? And yeah, I do totally. have breaking points. I still do. I uh, I'm not perfect, so I am always working on None that. None of stuff. us are. None yeah. of us are. I don't we're think, all a work in progress. Well, it's weird because I think we are perfect, but at the same time, we're not. Depends on how you're looking at the word perfect. You know what I mean? It's, Fair a, it's weird. Fair it's enough. a paradox. Yeah. yeah, I love this stuff. It just drives my brain crazy. So good. Last okay. question before we yeah. get on to the actual okay. topic. Let's then. go. Yeah. ISAO, Atmos Tree, how was it? Yeah, that kind of cool segue because uh, I'm always analyzing my own mind in these interactions, right? And I'm thinking about mm-hmm. Atmos Tree and its mm-hmm. purpose and everything. And um, I get there and, you know, the goal for me and the pushing factor to go to ISAO and spend all this money to get out there was to promote and bring awareness to other arborists about Atmos tree, right? So yeah, yeah. I'm giving everyone the quick pitch like, Hey, yeah, I got Atmos tree. Uh, it's an, it's a regenerative Alliance for arborists. We all come together and we charge recycling fees, $25 in Canada. And, uh, whenever we perform a removal and we plant two to one Atmos tree takes care of everything and we plant the trees. So you don't have to worry about it and blah, blah, blah. Right. So more information on Atmos or reach out to me if you're interested in be part mm-hmm. of the Alliance. Yeah. But, um, that's kind of the thing I would do, but it was tricky, man, because you feel like you're selling something. And then, you know, I, I'm pretty good at picking up on people's body language and, you know, to a degree we all are, but you can tell when someone's feeling like they're being sold something. Mm, totally. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of going about this wrong. I need to think about my perspective here. And I got this. Uh, expectation in my mind of where I'm going to go out there and to make it worth it I got to hammer Atmos tree and I got to get as many people as I can to sign up and whatever mm. and it's like I'm losing sight of like the purpose of Atmos tree you know which and part of that purpose isn't just getting trees in the ground but it's bringing together people in this community and me getting to personally know people that are in the alliance having them trust me I want to trust them because a lot of this is built on trust Yeah, and um being passionate about it and so that involved me having more genuine like trying to build more quality and genuine relationships out there nice. as opposed yeah. to quick hitting you know here's the website let's get your information then i'm going to pound you with emails after right yeah and to a degree you have to do some of that kind of stuff it you know because it, it does work and ultimately the more people we can get involved with that most tree i think the better things are going to be and the better the alliance mm-hmm. is going to be, the more trees we're going to plant. But Huge, ultimately yeah. at the end of the day, it's like, why am I doing Atmos tree? Why do I do anything? What is the point? Like, what is my purpose in life? When you, when you zoom out with that perspective, we were talking about way, way out. It's like, I don't, 
personally and selfishly, I don't want to be a salesman. I don't want to try and force people and change their mind that they have to join this alliance. Mm -hmm. It's like, I want to have uh, good relationships with people that mean something right at the end of the day. And uh, if that most tree is, is a step to getting to that point, that's great. But if I can just jump right to that point, that end result of having a, a new, awesome connection relationship with someone, it's like I'm skipping from A to Z right away and getting the yeah. most out of life yeah. that I can right now with, with a good relationship and being happy and meeting someone, whether they join Atmos Tree or not, right? Like, what's the point of life? So, why? <laughs> you know, of course, I know there's steps you got to get from A to Z to, to like do a lot of these things, but sure. yeah. It's like, you know, going to school and working and working all day all so you can get to retire. And then all of a sudden you have to go on vacation. And it's like, why do you go on vacation? It's because you want to spend time with your family and your friends and have those moments. At the end of the day, when you look back, it's like, what's the point of my life? Why do I like it? It's those moments. So Bingo. if you want to approach life a different way and, and not go to post-secondary school and not work every day, nine to five plus overtime and save up for a vacation, and like you don't have to live that way. You can, you can work less have less money and just skip right to the having good quality relationships with friends and family or whatever Bingo. it might be and get more fulfillment out of life with less money and less things too. Right. Yep. So yep. anyways, yep. getting super freaking <laughs> out there again with this, an answer to your question, but it just kind of, my brain's already in that space now, but no man, I that was it. a, that was a, a learning lesson for me. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. And that was nice. something I learned when I was out there. So I, I made maybe fewer new relationships than I had originally hoped. But the ones that I did make, I think, were quality. And they're going to go somewhere, right? And then in the future, mm -hmm. I don't know. And I'm going to trust in the flow, like we were talking about before, instead of trying to fight my way through everything. I'm going to trust that those relationships are going to span off and turn into something greater yeah, and man. better. And that things are naturally just going to come my way. Atmos tree is going to go where it needs to go. Um, all that kind of stuff. So it I was, it. it was great. It was, it was excellent. It was exactly how it needed to be, man. That's perfect. That's yeah. perfect. Oh, that's awesome to hear. And I got a little good feedback too. Nice. So, yeah. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be great. I know it's going to be great. I know it's going to be great. It has been great. And and it's I, going to I continue to be day out there too. I know. I saw that. I saw you went to that the ISA study day. Yeah, I didn't get That's my exciting. approval in time to write the exam. No, no. Uh, the next day, which was probably a good thing because I I didn't study before <laughs> I went. <laughs> but no, I mean, you didn't know, right? Yeah, but when they went through the rapid slideshow, like it was insane fast, right? But it was like kind of yeah. like here's what you need to know. Here's what you need to know. Um, and they hit all these points. I was like, okay, I learned a ton of this stuff through ARB CAN courses and through experience and self-study already. Bingo. So I was like, that's good. That's Bingo. good. Um, but there was a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't know yeah. or alluded to areas that I need to study more. So things like uh, cabling and like the anatomy of different types of cabling mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. parts yep. used, even stuff like that, or like these lightning systems and stuff, things that may yep. not be as... Uh, common in our area or just in general in a board culture they kind of test it on so i need to brush up on those things for sure right um, yeah 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 so well and i think that's such a key piece to some of those study sessions and and you know folks that are considering attending a study session or or writing an exam and, and it's across a myriad of different industries i mean the isa is relevant just because we're in our borough culture and that's what we're talking about that's the audience uh, but any industry has professional designations professional certifications and they all have study sessions uh, and so often i see folks walk into the study session expecting that this is going to be an exam prep that they're going to do this day and they're going to pass the exam uh, and it's not and it's exactly what you've just said it's an opportunity to see where you may need to focus a little bit more of your studying and what you have a good grasp on and that's all it is it's another form of preparation to help you figure out what you need to focus your study time on but yeah they it can was, be super valuable they can be super valuable it was worth its weight for sure so i mean yeah. it's kind yeah. of cool at this podcast uh, actually I met a lot of people that said they had already listened to the podcast it was awesome oh, right on. Was, yeah. excellent I was like, this is, I, I actually feel almost like the podcast is going to be a bigger thing that's going to have more influence and follow the direction of like what I want to do with connecting and all this kind of stuff more yeah. than like Atmos Tree is. Like yeah. Atmos Tree is cool too, but they're, they're kind of, they dovetail, but like they're kind of different. And I think 
I think this podcast is going to kind of be more than I thought it was going to be. I, I think so. And, and for the reason that you were just saying when it came down to your interactions at ISAO with regards to Atmos Tree, and it's, it's the difference between a short format relationship and a long format relationship. And the podcast gives the opportunity for that long format conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And it's something that you can't get in any other broad focused area. I mean, social media, like you can't, you can't throw up an hour and a half video on social media. It's just not going to happen, right? It's, you know, reels these days. What are they like a minute or yeah, a minute 30, I think a 90 second piece of information. Like it's just, you can't, there's the short format doesn't give you the opportunity to connect with people and to actually have those meaningful conversations and to build towards something. Uh, Whereas the podcast, I mean, everybody is, I got podcasts running all day, every day, right? Like after we're done this, I'm actually going to go tile a master bathroom and I'm going to have a podcast going the whole time. Like it's this long format. (laughs) Hopefully not a tile podcast. No, well, hopefully not. I don't know. I'm I'm no tile expert either. I just, I'm, I'm kind of the jack of all trades. I can do everything pretty good, but, (laughs) but no, I mean, podcasts are great for that. Right. And, and you know, I learn so much about myself and about the world and about perception and all these things that we've talked about for the last 45 minutes uh, from podcasts. And it, it really does open up your perspective to other, to other avenues and other ways of thinking. It's, it's, yeah, I think this podcast is going to be huge. I really do. Thanks buddy. I appreciate yeah. it. And you're a big part of that because, uh, this, is the, this you, is the inaugural episode it's right here. We're part yeah. three. In case Part someone three. just Let's randomly tuned into this podcast <laughs> and had 45 minutes and is of life. still listening <laughs> <laughs> after uh, 45 minutes of, you know, <laughs> totally. This is where you put like the little intro, the Arbus Blueprint intro video, and now it starts. <laughs> now it starts, yeah. <laughs> the rest was just the prequel. Put in those timestamps. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I don't even know actually where we were talking about that with the whole when I talked about the podcast and spun off from there, but yeah, things are good. Let's, uh, let's bring her back. Let's rein her in to part, uh, three here of the, how to mm-hmm. become a contract climbing arborist. Uh, if you want to know more about Sean, go back to episode one, uh, visit his, uh, Instagram, all that kind of stuff. He's, uh, at the Rocky mountain arborist, correct? Yep. At Rocky mountain arborist at yep. Rocky mountain arborist. Bingo, that's the one. Uh, you can see kind of what's going on there. But, but Sean and I are both uh, assistant instructors with Arbor Culture Canada. Uh, both run our own businesses. Sean is a contract climbing arborist uh, for a variety of companies. Has a diverse background, firefighter captain, ski patrol, rope access technician. Yep. All the things, man. Uh, bathroom All tiler. All the things. Bathroom tiler. <laughs> Construction <laughs> extraordinaire. Construction <laughs> guy. Yeah. Yeah, so the first couple episodes, we kind of went through the overall, they were really kind of straight to the point. So we didn't go off on this big tangent about life too much, which is, uh, you know, kind of ultimately where I'd love to go with this podcast and sprinkle it in and how it applies to a board culture or business and different things like that. So, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. Uh, I think it was, it was great though. I'm glad we went off on that tangent there. It was, it was good to have the conversation for sure. Yeah. yeah. So the first couple we covered kind of like well what is a contract climbing arborist how to get into it your different roles with you know working with the crews Mm -hmm. and what's it kind of expected of you all that kind of stuff part two we went into uh more some business uh related things like you know sole proprietorship versus incorporating and how you should charge hourly by the job like some hidden costs uh that sort of things ways to maybe diversify your business so we'll expand maybe a little bit on some of that stuff as it naturally comes up but in episode three, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit more about uh, some advanced, I guess you'd say, sort of things that maybe doesn't get considered right away in regards to some safety. You know, mm-hmm. I know like, people are usually not too intrigued by safety, but uh, it can be really important. And maybe we can talk about some simpler ways that people can get started with mm-hmm. how to be safe for the tree. So what mm-hmm. I'm referring to is the fact that as a contract climbing arborist, oftentimes you may be an independent person, not knowing the crew you're going to work with, not knowing their skill level. And you have to all of a sudden go up in this tree with a chainsaw. And of course there's all the potential dangers up there. There's dangerous rigging things out with uh, not knowing if people know how to run ropes for you or even set them up or they're tying and untying things or they're throwing your rope into the chipper. 
Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can just start there and you can talk about kind of what you do when you roll up to a site, um, whether it's, you know, with somebody you know or not, or what you would recommend someone to do um, to follow some of these safety steps. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of the biggest elephant in the room when it comes to kind of contract climbing or contract arboriculture. Uh, and it's something that we certainly try to drive home through instruction with Arbor Canada uh, is this concept of having both egress and having rescue from the tree. And I mean, it's it's pretty well understood within the residential arboriculture industry that if you're committed up into a tree, you should have somebody on the ground with kit and with experience that can come up and get you down. Uh, and that's kind of the norm, right? Because it's as soon as you leave the ground from the ground crew that's doing their thing, if nobody has the ability to come get you, nobody has the equipment to come get you or the knowledge or any of these types of things, you're essentially, you might as well be working on the moon because you're by yourself up there. Right. Yeah, you've got that communication, you've got that interaction, they're helping with the job, but as far as you and your safety, what's going on up there, you, you might as well be on the moon, you're by yourself. And so there's there's some things that I've started to kind of incorporate into my workflow over the years that kind of help solve some of the really kind of obvious safety issues that might present itself. Uh, first one being obviously egress. I try not to, depending on the crew, and, and again, this is fully dependent on crew. We kind of mentioned that in a couple of the other episodes. There's a few crews I work with that have really capable climbers, really confident climbers, uh, and we're more looking at the production side of things. Or, you know, I bring some tools and some specific rigging techniques that they might not have thought about, uh, but they're still super capable. And so in those situations, you can start to do a little things a little bit more traditionally, right? Tons of different redirects, tons of different sort of anchoring systems, stuff like that, because you know that the folks that are on the ground have the knowledge and experience to come solve those problems and help you. Mm. Uh, the crews that are super green, I mean, we talked about working with landscape companies. Uh, we've talked about working with companies that like maybe the climber on that crew is like super, super new to it or super basic. Uh, there's some things that I've started to incorporate to try and solve some of those issues. Uh, biggest one is egress. I will typically try to work off of an SRS basal anchored system if I'm working with a crew that is relatively green. Uh, okay. And specifically, I'll bring a fairly lengthy rope. Um, so in our neck of the woods, 150 feet is kind of the norm. Uh, I'll bring a 200 foot or even a 300 foot rope oh, wow. and I'll, th I'll throw it into a rig or some sort of descent control device. Uh, so the Petzl rig is one that most people understand. Rope access folks, you'll recognize the Petzl ID, uh, you know, Skylotech Sparks, Edelrid Megawatt. There's a Every manufacturer has one, but it's a descent control device. It's essentially a cam that is actuated by a lever. Right. And when you pull the lever, it allows the rope to feed it's through the It's midline device. attachable, right? Midline attachable. When it's not under yep. tension? Bingo, you exactly. Open, you kind of slide it open. Like if your two hands are together, you sort of slide one hand off. Yep. Rope ro runs through like a little bit of a redirection inside there with some friction, right? Bingo, yep. Close it up and there's like a handle. I don't know if anyone's been to rock climbing, like gree gree, that kind of thing. Totally. Where you yeah. pull the handle yeah. back, it moves something in there and then the, lets the friction out so you can feather Bingo. letting something down. Okay. Yep. And so I'll incorporate that into my basal anchor uh, because that is a device that you can typically spend 30 seconds to a minute and walk the ground crew through the process of undoing a couple half hitches and slowly pulling this lever. Uh, I happen to use a rig just because that's what I have that I've kind of dedicated to it. Uh, if you're working with super green crews, I recommend something like an ID or something that has an anti-panic feature. Because with the rig, if you open that handle okay. all the way, you're heading to the IHOP. You're and what's the difference between a rig and an ID? Uh, so a rig has no anti-panic. It's okay. basically a real bare bones descent control device. Uh, the ID has an anti-panic, so if I pull it too okay. far and the descent gets too fast, it actually pops and the descent stops. Right, but they can just reset uh, it by going all the way forward again. You go forward to reset okay. it and you're back That's into good descent to know, mode. Because I bet you yeah. a lot of people here, I mean, you just don't know. And you don't know, totally. they could be yeah. panicking, they could be experienced. So that was, ID sounds yeah. pretty ideal that way. 
it's, ideal. It's, and, you know, to tie it back to the 45-minute conversation we had, uh, we were talking a little <laughs> bit about fight or flight, right? Yeah. And that fight or flight response, that natural, resp that natural reaction that your brain kind of takes over and runs your body for, uh, you try and protect yourself. And by protecting yourself, you tend to pull your appendages into the core of your body. Mm -hmm. So the whole concept of anti-panic is as I'm pulling this lever to descend and I get going too fast, if I trigger that fight or flight response, my body's like, holy crap, let's go into body preservation mode. And you bring your appendages in you actually pull the lever even farther and you mm. descend even faster. Yeah. So the concept of anti-panic is I'm pulling the lever, I get that point where my body's like, whoa, man, this is crazy, and it starts to panic. And you do this to protect your limbs and your appendages, you trip the anti-panic and your descent stops. Okay. And that gives you the opportunity to take a breath and go, whoa, okay, I don't really want to go that fast. Let's learn to feather this. Does that um, new Edelred product, is it Megawatt? Is that, is yep, that one have yep. an anti-panic on as well? Yep. Okay. Edelred has anti-panic as well. Yep, yep. Most of them do. Uh, the big ones that are out there that don't, the Petzl Rig does not, uh, and the Skylotech Spark does not. Uh, but there is a Skylotech Sirius that is the exact same descender that has anti-panic. Uh, so there's, most of them out there have an anti-panic feature. Okay, 100%. can yep. we back up a little bit just to like the ultimate basics yep. um, as yep. far as how this setup looks? Because I'm not sure if anyone's familiar. And honestly, to be fully transparent, I don't do a ton of climbing myself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I do a lot of it solo, but I don't have any kind of uh, setups like this incorporated because uh, I mean, there might not anybody be there. I don't know. Or sometimes totally. maybe it's just the homeowner. I don't know. Could I use it with the homeowner and just show them like, not that I recommend doing that, but if you're, yep. it's probably reality. Some people do just go and work around a homeowner. Maybe they could set it up mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. let them know what's going on. But how, how yeah. do you set it up? Like, what kind of anchor are you using? Like, how are you getting the rope in the tree? All that kind of stuff. Yeah, so typical installation of your rope, right? Um, throw line, you know, find a spot in the tree, find a good union to get your, your rope through. Uh, with an SRS system, especially with a basal anchored system, I don't have to isolate a limb. I don't have to, you know, create this open work area for both my ropes to mirror themselves. I can kind of just throw it through a union, and if it comes through a couple different unions on its Plank way down... Through, yeah ultimately as long as everything's being pulled into compression and there's a whole other topic that we could talk about um yeah. and maybe I don't a, have to isolate would so you consider fast. a bigger a bigger sort of ideally like a beefier anchor like you never want to be on on the cusp 100%. but like with basal anchors we're getting a bit more force are we not at the yeah, top we are yep 100 percent. and and so when we talk about forces and climbing systems uh an mrs a moving rope system a lot of folks might recognize it from the older terminology of DRT or doubled rope technique, stuff like that. Uh, in an MRS system where, you know, the rope is moving in the continual loop as I'm advancing up and down the tree, uh, the force at the anchor is essentially my body weight. And, and we can draw out all sorts of, you know, in diagrams and stuff like that to help illustrate it, but understand that in an MRS system, the force at the anchor is my body weight. Okay. Right. As soon as we start to talk about SRS or static rope technique, uh, basically I'm moving and the rope is staying static. I can canopy anchor. So I have my anchor tied around the union up at the top and that's still one to one. My body weight equals the weight in the anchor. But as soon as I pass the rope through the union and anchor it at the bottom of the tree, let's say I'm 200 pounds. I need 200 pounds force at that basal anchor so that I can actually hang on the rope. If there's not 200 pounds of force here, the rope's going to move, right? Yeah. So because I've got 200 on both sides, that anchor now sees 400 pounds. It's so wild. I don't know. This doesn't, yeah. you know, I remember that, but it just doesn't sink in. <laughs> totally. So when you basal anchor something, you do double the load at the anchor point. So, uh, yeah, good to know. So if you're using 100%. a flimsy anchor point, consider the yep. fact that it's going to be double your weight. And plus, if you're humping your way up there or something, and there's a Bingo. little bit the of main shock loads. The movement, 100%. There's always, you're always putting in a little bit more than your body weight as you're transitioning up the tree because of movement, right? Even in a... Uh, SRS format where I'm using a foot ascender and a knee ascender and I'm the ultimate in efficiency there's still movement there's still stretch in the rope as you move uh, and that's increasing that force just a little bit at the anchor so 
when I, when I'm setting anchors, uh, typically, and, and this is advice that you'll hear from a ton of different people. I don't necessarily shoot for my final anchor. I look at the okay. tree and I say, Hey, that little guy way up there, like a hundred feet, 120 feet in the air. That's where I want to have my final anchor to work the tree. That's going to give me the best, most efficient working position in this tree. I'll typically come down a union because it's a little bit bigger wood. It's a little bit closer to the ground, so I can actually see it just a little bit better. Uh, and it gives me the opportunity once I get up there to see that final anchor that's probably quite a bit smaller than that next union down and actually visually inspect it. You know, we've talked about risk assessment and tree climbing. We've talked about all these things. What's going on with the tree? Is there any cracking up there? Is there any evidence of fungi, stuff like this? Right. Things that I might not be able to see from the ground. So I typically shoot one lower. Uh, if this is a super green crew and I'm going to work the tree from an SRS uh, position, maybe it changes a little bit of how the work is going to go. Maybe I have a temporary anchor that allows me to work position up a little bit more. There's all sorts of different techniques we can talk about. Okay. Uh, but getting back to the basics, before we get too far down the rabbit yep, hole, yep. what you're looking for is some form of a sling around the base of the tree. Uh, and so the, the big commercialized one that's out there, there's the ART snake anchor. Uh, you can use just like an ultra sling from rigging. Just make sure it's dedicated to climbing because once you rig on it, you probably shouldn't use it to hang your life on. Right. Uh, but some sort of a sling around the base of the tree. And to that sling, you use a carabiner to attach your descent control device. The megawatt, the rig, the ID, whatever it is. Okay, so a sling, it's like going... Oftentimes there's like loops or some sort of eyes along there. So you can just quickly, yep. which is also the other advantage, quickly put it through and kind of choke it to the length yep. that it needs to be. Yep. And then on one of those loops that's still sticking out at the end of it or whatever, that's where you're putting a carabiner. Correct. Yep. Okay. 100%. Descent control device goes on that. Rope comes from your high point in the tree through the device. And now you can do whatever the manufacturer specified lock off is. Usually it's like a couple half hitches or an overhand. Um, they're all fairly similar. But now I've got a solid anchor. And as long as I've actually got enough rope curled up on the ground beside it, somebody can come in, pull that lever and actually lower me down out of the tree. Right. So, so you want to orient your rope in the fact that the short end is going from the rig up around your anchor point and back bingo. to you. Yeah, so you're climbing on the short end. It can barely touch the ground sort right. of thing. Uh, and you want all the excess at the rig side of the uh, of the basal anchor. Right, probably in a bag and covered up yep. and out of the way, yep. not totally. being covered by yep. branches. Don't let and... it get drugged by branches and get thrown into a chipper, stuff like that. So it's ready to go and deploy. Bingo, yeah. yep. Okay. The key to it is you need at least three times the height of your tie-in. Right. So let's say my tie-in is 100 feet up. The point that the rope goes through the union is 100 feet off the ground. So I've got 100 feet from that union to the ground for me to climb up. Jeez, that's a long way. I need 100 feet down to the basal anchor. Right. And I also need 100 feet in the bag because if I'm way up at the top, I need that full 100 feet to lower me to the ground. Yeah. So you need a rope that's three times the length of your Maybe your throw tie -in. a stopper knot on the end of your ropes too. Get in the habit of doing that. Because Always. Always. You don't want to be letting that out and then... No. See ya, Sean. Well, and, and not that we're done talking about this, but we were going to get into some of the, the close calls sort of thing. Uh, I've I've had it where, you know, I've actually been rappelling down and hit my stopper knot. And it's like, mm, I'm glad I threw a stopper knot in there. That's I was a little bit higher Pucker than I thought factor. I was. Totally, totally. So anyway, stopper <laughs> knots. Good, good things to have. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of, that's a real good one because you can teach a ground crew. And as long as you have the ability, if something happens in the tree to ditch your lanyard, now I'm in suspension off that SRS system, the ground crew can come over and lower me out of the tree. Right. Now so I it can doesn't already... solve, sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, I can already see, foresee some problems 100%. with yep. this system and the fact that uh, yeah, if you're unconscious, I mean, or in a, unable to, like the whole reason that somebody would need to lower you down is that you're unable to do it. So you're either unconscious yes. or you, one of your arms or something is not working appropriately. Correct. So this means you may have trouble getting a lanyard off if you're using a lanyard. May, yeah. And 
you may not be able to untangle yourself from other branches or things as you're coming down. Because if you need to come down at some point, you got to be coming straight down off of the last redirect your rope was in, whatever that might be. So do you do you prepare like pruning away some stuff, thinking about that like on the way up? I, yep, I or do. Making 100%. yourself you're in a before you do a. I don't know. Uh, what do you do? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, and the point that you just made was where I was kind of, to kind of branch into is, is there's issues branch. that it doesn't solve. There you go. See, uh, trapped and pinned. If you get squished by a log that you're rigging, it doesn't matter if you've got a lowerable basal anchor, it's, it's, you're in trouble, right? Uh, if you can't get your lanyard off for some reason because you're unconscious or any of these things, uh, there are challenges to it. It's not, the epic this is going to solve your problems as a contract climber but it's something to consider right i also to to your point about pruning your way into your work uh your targets stuff like that i change my work pattern based on the crew i have nice and if i'm utilizing an srs lowerable system with a rig because that's the best i'm going to get not great but the best i'm going to get in that specific contract climbing environment I typically change my work routines. That's I thinking won't... outside the box. Yeah. And I like that because it, I know what you mean if I can just take a quick sec here. Is like, Please, yeah. I do similar things where you, and originally when you get into a board culture or doing any job, you kind of follow the prescription because you can't like mm -hmm. think for yourself yet until you get used to doing all these reps. And it's like, whether yeah. it's pruning or removals, you're like, well, I have to remove this tree because of this, or I have to prune this branch off because it's rubbing with that one or whatever. But Sometimes you think outside the box and you're like, well, I can do a better job of pruning this tree or I can make it safer for myself or I can save time if I just prune this thing out of the way in the tree and it's not going to negatively affect the job or the tree or its shape or aesthetics or whatever it might be. So it's always like risk versus benefit or whatever you want to call it or even removing trees. Sometimes I'll remove a tree at someone's house and it's like, you know, this tree is going to cost this much and be really unsafe and whatever if we remove this tree independently but if i can just remove this tree next to it it's going to make this scope of job cheaper safer yeah. all that kind of stuff so then you kind of think outside the box and remove two trees unfortunately but maybe it's maybe it's the way to go so kind of like yep. to what you're saying there so you prune differently yeah. sometimes depending on the or set 100%. things up depending on the crew okay well and i'll change up my actual work practices as far as you know when we start to talk about movement in the canopy and redirects and stuff like that, uh, if I've got 100 feet from my union down to the ground kind of straight, and now I redirect over here, and I redirect over here, and I redirect over here, the rope that I require gets longer and longer, right? Right. Because I've, I've moved it spatially. I don't have a straight path to ground anymore. And so if I want personal egress, now I need to have 150 feet because right. I'm going to redirect it here, redirect it here. That may no longer work with a lowerable basal anchor. Okay. And so I, I change my overall work practices. I look at the tree based on the crew and I might look at it and say, you know, it'd be great to have some redirects here, but I know that today I'm going to be using a lowerable system that may not be feasible for me. So now I start to incorporate, let's rather than just doing a straight redirect, what if we incorporate a second system, a triangulated system? With the, again, there's flaws to it. This is not the silver bullet, but it's probably easier for me if I need to get back into the trunk to lower myself out on the second system so that I'm a little bit more plumb and undo a carabiner. And now I've got that straight path to ground to be lowered. So rather than just using the one rope and redirecting, maybe I have two or three ropes or temporary, you know, a captain hook or some other temporary positioning anchor to help facilitate my movement that I can more easily ditch or, you know, let myself out on to get that rescue. Okay. So I guess it would depend on the situation, but do you, would you recommend, or do you often use one rope to access the tree and then just take like, say an MRS up there easier to yep. work around, but then would you completely come off of your other system? I will do that if I have egress to the ground if my MRS is going to touch the ground. And typically if I have another climber or somebody on site with gear and with enough experience and knowledge to ascend my line and come get me. Okay. So that, yeah. So your leftover line is a Bingo. way that people can ascend up the tree yep. to 
come get you. If so you've that's got nice. two climbers on a crew, like if you're working in a in a tree care company sort of setting where you've got two climbers on the crew, or if you're a contract climber coming in to work more production or more because of it's a weird elaborate scenario that you have the tools to to solve, and there's other climbers on the crew, uh, that's my go-to. And okay. it's I cannot recommend that practice enough. Install an access line, get into the tree, and then put in a work positioning anchor. And specifically, I just mentioned, you know, that's where I want to have my work positioning anchor. Throw into the union below it. A little bit bigger wood, a little more reliable. It's a little bit closer to the ground. I can see it a bit better. Throw there, ascend into the tree, and now establish an MRS anchor or whatever you prefer to climb on for a working system. Okay. Now I'm completely off the access line. And it becomes a dedicated rescue line, which is fantastic if somebody needs to come up and get me because they don't have to throw a throw line, install their own line. They just come up that same line and now they can figure out how to get out to where I'm at. Right. So what so about when you got two climbers? That is the, the bee's knees, in my opinion, personally. Yeah. And I want to get to some of these uh, different approaches to that mm-hmm. later on as we keep talking with double climbers and different people dedicated. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, um, so my, my, my brain is along the lines of this, this rig, and that was going to be the way for someone to save you from below. Yep. But if you switch yep. off that system to your MRS, it's great yep. for work positioning, whatever. Can anybody do anything at that point? Can they reattach nope. your MRS system, do anything down below? Nope. So, you're, so that is a drawback of doing that, I guess. Yeah, you, That's I, why you have I, to have someone that can come up the rope. Bingo. So yeah. if they can't, if you don't have someone yeah. that can do that, you don't even bother switching rope systems then you just stay on that one i stay on my srs i will work the entire tree on that srs because they can't climb up to get me anyway so having a dedicated access line for a rescuer they don't have the equipment they don't have the ability to come up to me anyway so i just stay on that line and i work the entire tree in that srs system you know there's all sorts of tips and techniques that you can you can look up you can find tons on social media that come to an arb can course modern tree climbing systems i will show you some there's tips and techniques you can use to do limb walks and to be more efficient in an srs environment actually working the tree like a bit of a rad uh, kind of system maybe yeah setting up some rad system stuff like that uh there's a couple different ways that you can utilize to assist your limb walk so that you're actually like pulling yourself in with a bit of mechanical advantage stuff like that um so yeah, there's there's techniques you can utilize uh, to make SRS more efficient for working the tree. Uh, and so I will typically just stay with that if I've got a super green crew and I'm relying on a basal anchor as a primary form of rescue, uh, I'll stay on the SRS system. I won't switch things around. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah. Um, so lanyards, because I was doing yep. some, I thought I was reading something or heard this somewhere, but I never had never really thought of it that yeah, like if you have a lanyard in a tree, that could be, it's great for work positioning and a second means of holding you to the tree if something were to fail in your climbing yep. system. Um, but it can also get in the way if you don't have a hand to release your lanyard or you're unconscious. Mm-hmm. Like, do you do anything different to prevent that? Like, do you try and use two different maybe rope systems instead of a lanyard? Like, do you ever avoid using a lanyard or do you just, do you think it's still more beneficial just to use a lanyard? <laughs> No. And, and I mean, it's, it's, we start to talk about work practices, you know, ANSI or any of the other local legislations that uh, you may particularly fall into. We have to have two forms of attachment to the tree as soon as we go to work, right? As soon as the saw comes out of the scabbard or the chainsaw comes up in our hands, we have to have two forms of attachment. Uh, And so for me, a, my lanyard is essentially a miniature climbing system. Like I can run MRS on it. I can run SRS on it. I've built my lanyard to do that. Okay. Uh, and so for me, it's essentially another climbing system. It's just much shorter. And how, so long, I, I, how long do you have it? Depends on the tree I'm working uh, and the situation. Uh, I usually, if I'm in a big deciduous tree, something like that, I typically have a 25 foot lanyard uh, that I've daisy chained up or I've used one of the various lanyard management keepers that are on the market now Jason to Climbs manage that. One. Yeah. With uh, ISC. You show yeah. me at the expo. Okay. If, if you mentioned it, I wasn't going to be the one to mention it, but care. yes. Uh, 
that's super awesome because I've I've seen I've had hands on Jason's like prototypes yeah. and they are awesome. I really 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 quite like them uh, and it's I'm so, honestly like I am so stoked that ISC is picking that up. Stoked for ISC, stoked for Jason. Like that's awesome, uh, and you guys are gonna love it when you see it. Like you're gonna love it. Yeah, it's but, a uh, it's like this little um, thing you put on your on your harness and then yep. has a multiple little loop connection or little connections where you can just kind of press your rope yeah, into little it and it'll hold it. And you just push your rope in and yeah. So you could have multiple yeah. yeah loops, I guess, of your lanyard hanging I down. So it. you could do a longer lanyard and bingo. Yeah, it looks cool. The Twenty-five lanyard. Shout out to Jason Klein. Lanyard works awesome with it. Yeah, shout out to Jason, man. That's a wicked lanyard system. Anyone pushing the limits of a board culture, inventing new stuff, rethinking the game, man. I'll I promote that for sure. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. So. Uh, I typically always have a lanyard. I've got a slightly longer lanyard because, again, it allows me to do a little bit better positioning, stuff like that. Uh, from a lanyard to a climbing system, you're still worrying about a carabiner, right? You're still worrying about undoing a carabiner. So if I've got a second climbing system, I still have to shed a carabiner in order to get back on the one primary system that can be lowered. Uh, so there is that challenge, and it's something to consider. If you've got a situation, and I have done this, where... I've got a situation where we're rigging big wood. This is a massive tree, big picks, like big giant rigging situations. We're using winches to pick things around and drift things. And there's really a lot of potential for some higher end sort of catastrophic injuries where a lowerable system may not be enough. I will have those conversations up front and I will try and get a second climber on site. Uh, and there's a, a, you know another couple contract climbers that I know real well in the area that you know, we kind of partner together when we're able to and, and kind of to build towards, I think one of the topics we wanted to talk about is building that collaboration, those kind of alliances amongst the contract world. Uh, I'll give them a call and I'll say, hey, I need to book you for a day just to come give me a hand. You know, it's not going to be super crazy elaborate, but I need somebody there because we're doing crazy rigging and I need to have somebody that can come up and help me if I get into trouble. Definitely. Uh, so that's, that's what an, I do. That's well, an option as well. When yeah. I call you, it's not usually... Uh not usually climbing or anything, but it's, no, yeah. it's something technical and it's something where you need another set of eyes and some yep, reassurance bingo. and some different tools. And But you need that expertise there. Not, you can't just use a groundsman or or whatever for for that kind of job. So definitely yep. worth collaborating and teaming up with other people and having some people kind of on call and working with each other. 100%. Yeah, for sure. So is your lanyard kind yeah. of like, uh, I've seen some online and I've been thinking about getting one but they were kind of expensive mm -hmm. so i imagine you just made your own uh i forgot the name of them now there was a green one but it was it was like this five you know whatever method <laughs> lanyard with a little came with yeah. a little pinto pulley and a totally. little hitch cord and you could do all sorts yep. of different things with it yep yeah i mean there's all sorts of pre-manufactured stuff out there uh and there there will always be conversations and and I am not endorsing this one way or the other, so just a <laughs> disclaimer there. There's always going to be conversations around homemade gear, right? Should you make your own gear or should you buy something that is specific to the purpose and is built for that purpose? Uh, my opinion on it and how I've kind of reacted to that is, you know, specifically, it's a Teufelberger product that you're talking about. Okay. Uh, it's, I forget what they call it, but it's big, long lanyard. There's a pinto pulley. There's a couple different attachments to it. There's a thimble if I want to do some different anchoring stuff. And it's, it's, that's, it's built for that. It's built as a multi-functioning lanyard. Uh, Camp's got some new ones out there, some gyro lanyards that look really, really slick uh, that are purpose built for it. I look at it from the standpoint of what is that lanyard composed of? That lanyard is composed of a rope. It's composed of a pulley and a friction hitch uh, or whatever other lanyard management or lanyard positioners are out there, ART positioners, Xeons, Greons, whatever you've got. Uh, the basics all form something that I have already and I can put together to create the same package. Right. And so for me, I won't go too crazy. Like it's it's. We start to get into the black ops world, right? Uh, yeah. and, like I do some black ops stuff that, you know, I'm working on a couple different things in the background that I'm kind of developing and tweaking Ooh, yeah. and like homemade, pure homemade stuff. But when I get onto the job site, that stuff doesn't necessarily come out all the time uh, yeah. because it's 
this is a, a an actual production job environment if something happens in a work and setting and i'm using that that's that's completely and totally on me there's no insurance or no anything that's going to cover that right uh, so I, I do play around in the Black Ops world. I do some homemade stuff, but I typically draw a line between, you know, stuff that I'm playing around with or, or going through some testing on and what comes out at a production job site. Right. And if you're making your own lanyard on site, like it's not like you're using untested gear. No. And if you no. understand what you're doing and why you're doing it, I think there's nothing wrong with making your own because I also have done that with like some of my yeah. lanyards and it's a great way to... Uh, upcycle or recycle your gear. Like I have climbing ropes Easily. that get nicked up, and it's like, ah, oh, what am I gonna do? Bingo. It's like, oh, sweet, I'll have a twenty-five foot uh, lanyard, and then yep. I know this section is really good. It barely gets used. It's always been sitting in the bag. Yep, can melt those ends off, and uh, it's still the same rope. It's still been tested to those limits. You know, it hasn't gone through any of those kind of shock loads or whatever it might be in that section. Yeah. And you have a carabiner that works fine, and you have a hitch cord that you know maybe you buy a new one or use an old one, like. It's fine. Totally. And it's not your main You know main the history point of, of the gear. Yeah, exactly. Even if it is, I mean, you know the history of the gear, right? You un, you bought yeah. it, you understand what you've put it through, and you understand how these systems work. Uh, because what is a lanyard? A lanyard is just a miniature climbing system. Yeah. Nine times out of ten, that's all it is. A little baby one. There's some lanyards that I could use in SRS. There's some that I have to remain in MRS. There's some intricacies to know, but essentially a lanyard is just a miniature climbing system. And so if you're going to take this rope out of the bag and you're going to grab this friction hitch and tie it around and put your triple attachment pulley underneath and build your MRS system to suspend yourself on, what's stopping you from taking a 25-foot section of that rope, putting a friction hitch on it, putting a pulley underneath, carabinering it, and now having a lanyard that doubles as an MRS system, right? Right. So it's it's that's, I mean... There's some stuff out there like, you know, you can get into some pretty crazy lanyard designs and, and I try not to, to get too far from the fundamentals of building a climbing system when I talk about lanyards. But uh, yeah, to me, it's, 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 I don't necessarily consider that homemade. I consider that configuration of gear. Yeah. And you've taken gear that you have and that you own and that you know how it functions and you've configured a system. It just happens that this is a short system that you're going to use for work positioning. Right. So. And if you can always get down to the why instead of yep. getting out of the mindset of like, here's the prescription, here's the instructions, here's what I have to do. And this is how this is supposed to be used as opposed yep. to understanding how the rope works. Why are you using that type of rope? Why are you using that style of carabiner or hitch cord? Like, why does the hitch cord have to be a few millimeters smaller than the rope? Like, why is all these things? And once you understand how the equipment actually works, like the why behind it, or as Arbiculture Canada says, the education component versus the training component, knowing totally. the why, then yep. you can use your own brain and be free thinking and think of how all of these tools are going to work, right? Like yeah. I always relate it back to the fire department and the rescue truck. The ambulance was protocol. This happens, do this. This happens, do this. Rescue truck, it's like, here's all these tools. Your job essentially is to know how to use those tools, the intricacies of what those tools, how they function, what's the physics yeah. behind it, what's the load limits, whatever. Because then you face with some situation with a car that's on top of another car that you no one's ever seen or could have predicted. And it's like, okay, what am I going to do? No one's there to tell you for this protocol. Here's how you're going to approach that situation. It's like, no, mm -hmm. know how your tools are going to work, know the limitations, and then Bingo. start using yeah. them to come up with your own idea. Which brings us full circle back to episode one when we started to talk about uh, you know, folks wanting to get into contract climbing. Uh, and we kind of came to this uh, discussion point of being able to think outside the box and being able to problem solve and to see the situation you're presented with and find the solution. Uh, and that is the big one, right? And linking it back to what you just said, you know, Arbor Culture Canada, we talk about the difference between training and education. Training tells you, you know, do this. This is what you're going to do. You're going to take this particular cord, put it on this particular rope, put it with this pulley, and that's how you're going to climb. Great. They might even show you how to tie that. They might show you how to tie that friction hitch on there so that you can do it every time. Education answers the question why. And that's the kicker. That's if, if you want to get into the world of contract climbing, if you want to progress in any industry you're in, fire service, business, you know, whatever it is you're doing in life, 
That's the question you need to focus on is why. Yep. Because once you understand why, you understand how the gear functions, you understand its limitations, you understand where you can and shouldn't use it, now you can build solutions that are custom made for that problem. And that's why you get the calls as a contract climber. That's how you progress in any industry. That's, you know, that's why we have such an amazing rescue group within our fire department is because we have focused on the why. And I, I challenge people. I say, anything I show you in a training environment, ask me why. Because if I don't have an answer, then I need to rethink why the heck am I even showing this to you? Where did I get this from? Why is this part of the curriculum? Yeah. Because I, I pride myself on that why question. I always encourage people to ask why, and I always ask it myself because I want to understand the intricate details. I want to understand how these things can go together, how these things can mesh to create a system that we can utilize for whatever it is we're doing, right? Yeah. So and 100% I agree with that. So much easier to remember and have stuff sink in when you understand the why. Bingo. Then you don't have to really remember how to do, you know, because yeah. that'll just come naturally, right? Absolutely. Like it's, it's so hard to just remember the prescriptions of every little step of doing something. But yeah, I know. I love those like aha moments, you know, where you just like, it just clicks and it resonates like, oh, I get it now. Like, that's why this happens. And like, once you have Bingo. that feeling, that's just locked in, Yeah. you know, and that's going to yeah. be, that's the root. That's the root that's going to turn into all these different branches and limbs of opportunity and possibilities totally. for you to use that. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Right on. Okay. I like that. Um, anything else you think we should touch on? I mean, I don't want to go too far into the, the rescue stuff because that's, yeah, I think when people want to go beyond that, there's, there's courses, there's different things they can do as far, yeah. as far as exploring how to climb up those lines to get people out of the tree, different methods. That's really complex. <laughs> and a little, little fly buzzing around. But uh, yeah, I mean, the other thing I'll, I'll kind of mention and throw out there from a rescue perspective, uh, again, depending on the skill level of the crew and what they may be used to, uh, I will actually adapt the configuration of my system. Not even just like, okay, today we're doing an SRS that's lowerable. Uh, maybe today I'm going to climb on an MRS system because it's a, you know, a big sprawling willow and we're doing a little prune. It's just easier for me to cl like ladder climb up into this thing to prune some stuff off. I'm going to be on an MRS system the whole time. Uh, I may change the actual configuration of the system I have based on the crew. And what I mean by that is there's techniques that we can utilize with certain climbing systems like a hitch climber. If I've got a tiny little micro pulley, I can incorporate that in and now the person on the ground can actually take control of my line and lower me out of the tree. Ground assisted lowering technique. Arm can course. Go take it. Okay. Plug. Anyway, <laughs> I will actually change the configuration of my my climbing system based on who's there. If this is somebody that they got a little bit of experience, they understand some knots, they understand how a friction hitch works, I could throw a pulley in and they could lower me out pretty confidently. I'm probably not going to reach for the Akimbo or, you know, the, the Rope Runner Pro or any of these other ones because they may not be familiar with it and it can limit some of those ground assisted rescue options. Right. Uh, and so it's, it's, I mean, it's, we talked about this in episode one. You do not need to have every single climbing system out there. If you love the Akimbo and that's your go-to, that's amazing. But if you want to do some contract climbing stuff, I challenge you to at least get familiar with a hitch climber and be confident with it. Because the hitch climber has a lot of different options and usabilities from ground assisted rescue. Uh, and again, like it's, it's, we could do an entire, I mean, there's a three day course uh, of modern tree climbing systems and then a two day of you know, yeah. tree climber rescue and emergency preparedness that Arborcan does that focuses on some of these techniques. So, you know, I don't necessarily want to dive into them too much, but uh, they're out there. They work. You can do them with hitch climbers. You struggle a little bit with some of the other systems. Uh, and so I'll actually pick and choose what I climb on based on the experience level. Maybe this is a climber themselves. You know, they're a little bit green, but they have some experience, but they climb on a zigzag every day. Perfect. I'll throw a zigzag on. We'll climb on that today because you're familiar with it and you understand how to operate it if you need to come help me. Right. Uh, and so just kind of picking and choosing that way, right? So getting back to perspective, I guess, mm -hmm. 
it's part of the responsibility, I think, for your own safety and others yeah. as a as a contract arborist or contract climber, whatever you want to call it. If you're coming in, you're often viewed as this professional, this person who's, you know, they brought you in special. You're the specialist, right? Um, you need to think beyond just the simplicity of how am I getting myself in the tree? How am I, what branches am I going to cut down and all this day-to-day -day stuff? That's why you need this foundation, I think, of experience so that those things yeah. are almost natural and you're not stressed and worried about the actual production because your mind should be now more geared towards what's my relationship with these guys? How much do they know? What are some potential hazards that are going to happen? You almost have to like look towards and, and try and uh, think of all possibilities that could happen and how you're going to set yourself up for those situations uh, ultimately. Because if, if you don't, then you could be in those sticky situations. 100%. So yep, speaking of sticky situations, do, do you have any nice uh, segue. share with us some close calls you had, if any? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's I think the biggest one, uh, when, you, when you start to talk about those sketchy situations or those close calls, uh, the biggest one that is kind of unique, I, don't know, I won't say unique, but the biggest one that crops up in a contract climbing setting is this concept that you've been brought in because you're the guy and you have to solve the tree and you're there for that explicit purpose and so you can tend to push yourself into environments that you may not have if you were part of a, a tree climbing company like this was your company you are servicing this client you might be a little bit quicker to say hey you know what because of this environmental condition or because of this situation today or whatever is going on maybe you know i'm a little bit sick or something like that i'm just i'm my head's a little foggy today for xyz reasons you may be a little bit more i guess inclined to reschedule with that client you may not um but there's a little more leeway, right? Yeah, you have control over that because it's your business. You yeah, can just, exactly. Yeah, exactly. When with contract climbing, it's like you can fall into this trap where you were brought in to solve the tree, and the expectation is that tree is solved. And today. you're on the clock potentially by Bingo. the hour or Bingo, exactly. And so you can tend to overlook some of those, I guess, trends and tendencies. And this is something that. Uh, you know, I, I learned from Tony to bring it back to the conversation you were having about Tony's presentation. Tony does a wonderful conversation about trends and tendencies. Uh, and, you know, he relates it to one-handed chainsaw use. And, you know, oh, maybe it's okay this one time. Next time it's like, well, it worked last time. It's just, you know, it's just today. And then pretty soon, trends and tendencies, all you're making is one-handed chainsaw cuts. You don't even remember how to do a two-handed cut. Uh, and so I, I often think about that when we start to talk about all of the different factors that can increase the risk level of whatever tree activity you're doing that day, be it environmental, be it, you know, complacency, be it tired, be it just not feeling you got that fog in your brain, whatever the case may be. It's easy as a contract climber to ignore those trends towards an incident. Right. Uh, and, and specifically i can think of a few where environmental factors were a big part of this uh you know maybe it's a green crew you're doing something a little bit more technical and elaborate and now you've got the wind faced right in your face at like 60 70 k and you've got this big old rotting top from a multi-stemmed octopus spruce that you need to go in this particular way and it's back weighted and you got a pull line in it and the ground crew's pulling with mechanical advantage but now you got a 70 k wind in your face and it's like no this has to come down today i've been brought in to do this job it's happening uh and things can go sideways on you pretty quick right so it's it's the big one from a contract climbing perspective is that and i'm certainly guilty of like the trends and tendencies and kind of ignoring some of those and saying right. no man like i'm here to do a job let's get it done it's uh, a different level like yeah. you have to be you have to be that person that has that that control over that communication and foresees all these yeah. things and it's like yep. you're not just thinking day to day on that stuff yep. yeah and it, it comes down to uh you know looping it back to some of the other conversations we've had in the podcast is communication open upfront honest communication yeah uh, and and i i talk through everything i do i don't know if it's you know some people might just think it's really frustrating but as soon as i leave the ground i'm talking everything i do i'm talking about where i'm putting my lanyard i'm talking about the knots i'm tying i'm talking about all of this stuff 
because A, it keeps everybody in the loop, but B, it facilitates some of that open and honest communication and gets me recognizing some of those trends that I might not have recognized if I was just focused on the task. Uh, and so I talk my way through things and maybe the wind is in my face today and I'd be, I'd be talking about that. I'd be like, ah, this wind is kind of in the face. Like, I really need this piece to go that way. Okay, so I've got a little bit of back weight. How can we solve that? Maybe we can do this. Uh, and then you start to recognize situations where you know what, like, this is probably not going to go this way. This is probably going to be a challenge. And I can't go backwards because there's a power line behind me. I can't, like, I only have one option. Maybe the best situation today is to, let's take a breather. Let's go grab lunch. Maybe the winds died down after lunch. Check the forecast, do whatever. Maybe we come back first thing tomorrow morning and just hammer this out, like, whatever the case may be. Uh, but I find that helps me locate some of those trends that I'm kind of ignoring. Uh, and it's something I've learned to do because when I first started into this industry, I wasn't doing that. I was the guy that was focused on the task right in front of my face. And I never really had, like we've all had those close calls. We've all maybe dropped something on a fence as we're learning or doing whatever. Uh, but there's been a few where you look back on it now and you're like, okay, I could see the trend mm -hmm. towards that top landing on the fence or that top wiping out half of that poor little apple tree because I was ignoring the trends and I we got to get this done. This is to, I've brought in to do this job. We're going to do it. Uh, and so it's it's those are kind of the biggest, I guess, that I will kind of notice or, or recognize within the contract climbing world. Um, I mean, obviously, there's still the same hazards you get with any other tree climbing job. Uh, and, and there's challenges with we talked about with rescue and with all these other different things. But from close calls, it's really the extra pressure you get uh, as a contract climber, I think, that adds that extra element to it for sure. For Definitely. Sure. I love some of those points that you made. And I think if I could offer some advice to people, too, mm -hmm. there on what you mm -hmm. said, when you look back in hindsight, that's where we can learn a lot of things. Is if yeah. you want to accelerate your path to being this this leveled up arborist that can foresee potential challenges or yeah. be able to be, you know, confident in going and having these conversations to maybe push the job off or whatever you were, you know, alluding to there, is make a conscious effort. Maybe at the end of the day, try and build a new habit and a routine to reflect on what you did. Like have a conscious, uh, you know, review of how things went and mm -hmm. maybe even write it down maybe keep a journal yep. write yep. down what happened and then think about because there's something that happens with your brain when you write stuff down too by hand you know 100 percent. but uh you know reflect on those some of those challenges you had or things that might have went wrong especially if things went wrong that day you know and and try and trace back how it originated was it based on how you felt did you not speak up when you should have was somebody acting kind of out of line or you could tell maybe you didn't have that experience or education that you should have spoke up and said something or intervened or should you mm -hmm. have actually installed another rope when you're feeling like, yeah, it's probably fine. I don't want to take this extra time. Recognize what it was and the root of why that happened. And then, you know, maybe even write down those solutions and then try and make an yeah. effort to change yeah. that in the future. And then honestly, it sounds kind of dumb, but it's the same as like gratitude journals or doing anything. But when you, when you write this stuff down, and, and kind of like force yourself, make this conscious effort to do it and do it regularly. It does become natural over time. For me, I find it takes like three to five weeks before it becomes like a bit of a, a, habit, a habit and ingrained. Yeah. And then you'll notice that like your thoughts towards those jobs in the future will like organically like come out of your subconscious or wherever your thoughts come from to, uh, you'll, you'll just be aware of them. You'll be aware of that situation when it happens. You'll be like, oh, I can make a, I can intervene here and I can make a change as compared to what you had done before. So I think that will happen organically and naturally over time from our mistakes. You know, we're always being guided in that direction, but yeah. you can make it a lot faster by probably consciously reflecting on it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, I cannot, I guess, agree more in your statement about journaling. Uh, it's, I think the ability to sit down at the end of the day and journal what's happened uh, in whatever you're doing, maybe it's, you know, interpersonal relations that you've got going on right now. Maybe it's your work, maybe it's whatever, but the ability to sit down and journal unlocks so much deeper understanding for why we made the decisions that day and where we might be able to, you know, experience things differently with a different perspective in the future. 
Uh, and so it's something that I do every single job, pretty much every job I do when I get home at the end of the day, I sit down and I journal about it. And I might even, it may be as simple as a really crude little diagram of how we rigged that particular branch that yeah. day. But it's something to jog my memory so that I can look back on it with renewed perspective and say, hey, you know what? Like that actually may not have been the best situation because of X, Y, Z. I can put a couple notes on it. And yeah. now I'm building my mental toolbox, right? I think it's... Uh, it's so important for us to to renew our perspective on things. And, and for me, it's really allowed me to look at things with a different set of eyes. We talk about trends and tendencies. Uh, we talk about the concept of accidents, right? An accident is not truly a random situation. It's a highly complex system that builds on itself. There's indicators that lead up towards yeah. that. And by journaling and by analyzing what's gone on in a day and having that ability to flip back and look at a few different things, yep. it allows me to recognize some of those you indications. You can pull back the veil and reveal Bingo. some of those things that will they'll come to you too while you're journaling that you would not be able to just reflect on maybe when you're driving at home. Yep. But you're sitting down and, and, privately and doing it and it's like, yeah. oh, oh, yeah. Bingo. And it may not always lead to, oh, you know what? Like I'm recognizing some trends and tendencies. We're not doing this. We're not doing this today. Sometimes it's as easy as just recognizing that and having a bit of a reset. Uh, and and something, I, and I'll use an example from this research contract that we were just involved with. Neil and I were bouncing around, doing a bunch of different climbing, climbing these ponderosa pines, getting up, pulling the scion buds off. Uh, and there was one particular day of the contract and, you know, whatever the reason was, there was just some weird stuff going on. Uh, we were utilizing a rotary winch, a Harkin rotary winch at one point, and the bit that went in the drill fell out and we lost it. And we're like, oh, geez, that sucks, but whatever, we got a spare, keep moving forward. Uh, and then we needed to access an area down a power line and we like went to pull the truck in and things were like, oh, I don't know about this. And there was... Even these little bits of things that, you know, from our ability to look at perspective and, and from analyzing our own and journaling and all these other types of things, we kind of both said to each other, like, hey, man, like, there's some weird stuff going on today. Like, it's how often do you lose a bit out of the drill? How often do you like, I don't know, there's some weird stuff going on today. And even recognizing that was enough for the two of us to kind of reset mentally and refocus. Didn't have another issue the entire day. So it's, it's not necessarily that you're getting this, yeah. you know, you have to stop for the day and stop working, but being able to look at things with renewed perspective and recognize those trends and tendencies and say, Hey, let's just identify what's going on. There's some weird stuff going on. Have a quick chat. Okay. We're good. This is the plan. Yep. Everybody's still green on the plan. We'll just, you know, reinvigorate what's going on. Uh, and you can avoid a lot of those issues for sure. So. Yeah, that's uh, that's really cool that you you mentioned that. I think about that a lot too, and you know, being like sort of a woo woo dude, once in a while, um, I notice those things happen to me all the time. And then as soon as you're like, I don't know, you make this switch, it seems so like high level and weird because you can't define any of that stuff. But no. you get these feelings, and you get these little little hints throughout the day of things that are like out of your control, right? Like you can totally. use your free will to control. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go up that tree. I'm just going to keep moving forward, whatever. But then all these external factors from like, I don't know where it comes from, the universe, whatever, you lose the bit, you do this. I yeah. start tripping on branches and getting hit in the face. I can feel my energy change. That, totally. that weird feeling like just, and you start like tying them together. And it's like some external force is like telling you, it's trying to like wake you up and say like, okay, there's something you need to stop and review or reflect yes. on, or it's trying to prevent you from making a bigger mistake. Or I don't know. I don't know what it is, but it's crazy when you start paying attention to these like nuances mm -hmm. of things happening mm -hmm. to you. And then you can like redirect and take control again of whatever's happening or rest in the fact that yeah. maybe, maybe it's preventing something bad to happen. So I do the same thing. I'll, I'll stop like when I'm doing tree work by myself because I, I literally get hit in the face by branches as soon as like my energy changes and I'm like hangry totally. or whatever's happening. hundred percent. I don't know why. Yep. The, the tree just starts yep. kicking the crap out of me. <laughs> I'm like, and I'm, and I'm getting angrier. Totally. And I stop and I have to go sit in the truck. I eat something, you know, maybe I close the eyes. I do a little bit of that breath work or something. I just yep. do whatever I got to do. Call my wife, you know, vent, whatever, just to get, get that out. Reset. Reset. Bingo. Find that reset button. Yep. Come out 
and then it's like it's okay it's good things things work out or they don't but i mean you, you figure out a solution to whatever you need to do to move forward yep. and i find if i don't hit that reset button man it's like then the next thing that's going to happen is a negative interaction with the client or someone Bingo. or myself yes. whatever and yep. then it's all of a sudden yeah they read your energy they're pissed off and then you're button heads and then it's their negative energy your neg- and then Oh my God, then it's bad reviews and then you're hating. You don't want to be an arborist anymore. Oh my God. It's just like the snowball, yeah. right? The snowball is going downhill. Trends and tendencies, <laughs> oh brother. It's all it is. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. So that's really cool. Yeah. No, the, that reset is key. And, and I mean, and this is, this is for anybody, uh, not necessarily just contract climbing, but don't be afraid to pull that reset button or push that reset button or do what you need to do. Uh, and it's like, I've done it on job sites. I've done it all sorts of different ways where it's just like you're starting to feel things creeping up, right? You're recognizing some of these issues. You're recognizing that there's a little bit of emotion starting to play into it. Uh, I hit the reset button. And even if it's as simple as like, okay, everybody, let's shut the chipper down. Let's like, let's have a five minute conversation. This is how this is going to go. This is what I'm foreseeing. Talk through it again. And even that process calms you to the point where the reset button's pushed and now you can get back to work. It yeah. doesn't necessarily mean you got to come out of the tree or, you know, sometimes you need to come out and go sit in the truck and have something to eat because you're super hungry. My big one, hydration. I am like the worst for hydration. I get up in the tree and I'm like, I work all day. I work through lunch and all of a sudden it's like three in the afternoon. I'm oh, like... Yeah. I haven't had a single sip of water. It's no wonder I'm getting a little bit foggy here. Like, can somebody throw my water bottle on? And I got to take five minutes. Let's just reset. Let's get some water on board. Let's talk this through. Yeah. Uh, yeah, man. Breaks yeah. are important. Huge. Huge. It's like RPN, yep. that course, Train the Trainer, when they talk about just even yeah. trying to incorporate all that knowledge and information that's coming into your brain. Like, you, they have those accelerated learning techniques, and it's all yeah. tied together. Like, taking yep. breaks at certain times or, you know, you hear of other cultures and countries where they they work for a certain amount of time and they get up and they move around and like some some crazy routine or when you're studying it's like you can study four hours worth in an hour if you just take these breaks and mix up your brain like micro breaks that shit works man yeah dude yeah Yeah, micro breaks are crazy unlock right there yeah cool so any that pretty much it for your uh any close calls anything else worthwhile (laughs) just mentioning or no i mean i think it's it's you know Close calls are everybody's had them, kind of thing. It's it's if you if you sit there and say ah, I've never had a close call, then you're probably not necessarily either truthful or you're not necessarily pushing yourself a little bit. Um, we all have close calls. That's the reality of it. the The biggest difference between you know focused on the difference between contrast climbing and uh, regular tree work, running a tree company, doing these things. The big one is that. I would say the added pressure and you may operate your tree service a little bit differently. You may like, no, I've committed to this client today. We're getting it done today. That might be how you operate. And that's, you know, that's a pull. I I applaud that mentality. Um, But uh, yeah, I think the the contract climbing pressure of like, you've been brought in specifically for this purpose and, and you don't want to let this client down this, this person that's contracted you to come in and do this. Uh, and so it does add that extra little bit of pressure and it can push towards making some decisions that maybe weren't the best in right. the situation. Because so. your your judgment is sort of sort of clouded with that pressure. And totally. this ties together the relevancy of the whole first 45 minutes we talked about. Bingo. All this, you know, self-actualization or personal development, self-help, whatever you want to talk about. You know, when you work on that stuff yourself, because really, all that reality is is your own experience of whatever's happening around you. Yeah. You ultimately control where the line is. You know, no matter yep. what's happening around you, you can't control what's happening around you. You can't control that you're being judged by other people, or that there's this added pressure on you, or the time that's going by, or the weather. You can't. All you control is how you respond and interpret these things, right? So if you can yep. work on yourself, then all of a sudden this pressure is not so great, right? And it it applies to everything in your life, not just when you go on the job, but you'll realize that being an arborist or starting a business or learning how to market yourself or market your business, build these relationships, talk to the customer, how to have hard chats when things are going wrong, how to public speak and talk to people or uh, influence someone, all of this stuff. It is 
all related to your own personal development and knowing how to deal with your emotions and you know somewhat take control of them and use them to your mm -hmm. advantage instead of having your Bingo. emotions and this pressure this fight or flight whatever it is instead of letting it have it control over you right 100 percent. yep yep 100 percent. that's why i think it's so important i think that's the the blueprint part of the arborist blueprint you know it's it's the nice. it's the root we're going after the roots here right and then we're going to yeah, manifest some beautiful leaves I love it. I love it. <laughs> Everyone, hopefully people are still tuned into this stuff, you know? Tuning in. Ooh. Neat, 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 neat. All right, cool. So I had some ideas if you want to move on. Is there anything else you want to say yeah, there? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Let's do it. So basically one last kind of big topic as far as like different ways to think about approaching the job as an arborist, uh, mm -hmm, sorry, as a mm -hmm. contract arborist, contract climber. We kind of alluded to some different hybrid business styles in the other episodes, but... Yep. I had this idea kind of come to me when I was putting together this, this outline and was doing maybe contract climbing as more of a team. So you say mm -hmm. like you have some people that you collaborate with and that's, that yep. could be how it looks is like you have a collaborative effort. But I mean, you could start like a partnership type, type situation either as you um, as like the lead climber and then maybe you bring someone on as like an apprentice and mm -hmm. you're training yep. them, but you have a trusted person that's with you all the time like this person that's trained to be the second set of eyes from the ground, um, helping you set up, maybe they're actually helping set up the rope and doing all that as they apprentice and get to learn more. Mm -hmm. And you know, would eventually get paid more and maybe, maybe they spawn off and start their own thing eventually and you guys just collaborate. But it might be a nice way to approach some of these jobs because I feel like a lot of the problem here is that you're going into this like alone and there's advantages to that. But there's also these disadvantages, right? Where you're meeting Huge. people for the first time and they're, they have revolving staff and revolving crews, but yeah. if you had another climber there, it's like, well, now, now you're doubling production, potentially, depending on what the job is. Uh, yep. You have someone there that's going to keep you a lot safer. They know how to run your tools. They know how to get you down and rescue you. They could be trained specifically as like your climber groundsman. You mm -hmm. know, maybe they're supervising what's going on down below. Maybe you have communication in headsets to them directly, and then they're leading the crew on the ground. So yeah, hundred percent. This might cost more, but it, it can. Maybe it's uh, the way things should be done, though. I don't know. Yeah, it's something I've wrestled with a little bit, um, kind of through my contract climbing sort of environment. Uh, and there's, I mean, I've been frankly blessed in the mentors that I've had the ability to kind of learn under and to tutelage under. And I tutelage. want to tutelage. I want to return that right. I mean, it's the ripples come and the ripples go. And you, and you want to make sure that you're giving those opportunities to other people and, and giving it back to the industry that's given me so much. And so I've, I've often looked towards ways that I could create some mentorship on a job site. And, and I've tried it. I've brought folks onto my job site that are super green and, and with the express purpose of mentoring. And, you know, I've taken a hit to my own because I don't necessarily want to charge the client too much more. Uh, like there's some conversations, maybe a couple bucks more just to help sort of, uh, you know, make yeah, that you know feasible for everybody. Person on the uh, ground I've often helping. taken a bit of a hit. Bingo. Yeah. And there's been some clients that are like, this is great. This is fantastic. You got a ground person. Perfect. Well, my crew will show up at the end of it and chip it and great. Uh, so there are opportunities for it. Uh, the challenge that I've kind of run into is the the number one way to get experience is to do it, right? You can watch it. You can be told about it. You can be told why. You can get the training. You can get the education. But it's time in the saddle. It's, it's getting up there. It's doing the thing that you're mentoring to do. Uh, and it kind of becomes a little bit of a challenge sometimes in the contract climbing environment specifically because you're being brought in because this is some elaborate technical job uh, that requires a specific expertise. And so, yeah, I really want to give this person the opportunity to get up in the tree and to get some hands-on practical experience as part of the mentorship program. But how far can you push that, right? Because if they're up in the tree doing something technical and I'm up in the tree right beside them, we can get into some issues that way, right? Now all of a sudden something takes both people out or who knows, right? 
So there's there are challenges. There are ways to navigate it. Uh, it's something that I've definitely been wrestling with. I've tried to do, and I would like to continue to explore. Uh, if there's anybody in the Calgary area that wants to come out and do some mentorship, please let me know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, as far as a consistent day-to-day job, uh, I, f- I think it's a challenge in the contract climbing environment. Um, there's definitely, you know, a couple days a week or something like that. You can get somebody involved, but to keep them employed every single day, A, it's a challenge with some of the work that comes in, but B, it, and I'm not trying to sound rude or anything, but it takes away from some of the flexibility that I enjoy so much about the contract arborist world, yeah. right? Cause now I'm kind of worried about another person and making sure they're employed and making sure they're making income and stuff like that. Right. So it's, it's, you know, there's. There's pros and cons to it. Um, I definitely have a few folks that I work with that, you know, if it's not another contract climber, it's a trusted grounds person that has some rope experience that I know can at least operate certain systems to get me out of a tree if that's the situation I have that day. Yeah, maybe that's what it Uh, is. is You just have sort of your own go-to grounds person. Yep. Yep. Maybe someone that only wants to be a grounds person and they just want to work with you whenever things pop up. Yep. So there's, there's opportunities out there. Um, yeah, I think it's it's from a, a creating some form of, of collaboration. I think, you know, to me, that's the big unlock. And I completely understand that I stand on this pedestal of this, like, contract climber instructor standpoint where it's easy for me to preach how things work. Uh, you're not, you know, on the ground fighting for the contracts with the clients, getting underbid by all these other companies. And I, I completely and totally understand that I am coming at this from a bit of a pedestal. Um, but to me... I think the only path forward for a sustainable industry in which we can actually make this a profession and increase the level of professionalism within our board culture is through collaboration. Yeah. I think it's it's the more we continue to be in competition with each other, the more we continue to undercut each other's prices, the more we try and find the absolute minimum bottom line and now we're going bankrupt and it's just... I I don't see a path forward towards proper professionalization in that um, in that sort of environment. And so, you know, I encourage you as a contract climber, especially to try and lead some of that charge. Reach out to other contract climbers in your area. Have those conversations, right? And it you may not have them right off the bat because everybody likes to hold their cards close to the chest. But develop that relationship, develop develop those friendships, and you know, for example, I know what the other what a couple of the other contract climbers in my area charge. And it turns out that we all charge the same thing. So again, collaboration comes into play, right? Um, yep. So we're, we're, we're making sure that we're not, you know, there's plenty of work out there for everybody. There really is. Uh, and if we want to pursue that professionalization of the industry, we got we to gotta start to work together and stop doing this all the time. For so. sure. I mean, my mind is always going, but I had another idea too around that was like, yep. it'd be cool if someone because I can't do everything. <laughs> totally. I, I want totally. to do everything. But, you know, if someone was kind of thinking like us and uh, wanted to create like almost like a an alliance for contract climbers, maybe it's just in Alberta, I don't know, but some sort of, yep. you know, voluntary regulation type type thing, like a set of standards or practices that people want to follow. And this this could totally build and expand. It could come with you know, almost like some prerequisites. Maybe you have to go and get a couple of courses or do something. Maybe you have to mm-hmm. be ISC or I don't know what it has to be, but like something to come into this group. And then maybe like a little bit of a, just like Atmos Tree, like a little bit of a certification or sure. a badge that you can tag on to yourself to give you some sort of credibility that you're a part of something as a contract climber, right? And that could be also include like this network and online forum where you can discuss the industry openly, talk about, you know, what yeah. people are charging for what you do, for what type of role. And maybe mm-hmm. it's a way to connect these contract arborists for other jobs where you need to team up with somebody else or how to access 100%. a pool yeah. of, of groundsmen that are willing to kind of just like pop in, um, yeah. you know, on yeah. jobs just for the day or for like just a week at a time. And they're looking to mentor and transition up. So then you got this pool of guys that just want to learn and come out and they're willing to work for not very much because they're learning at the same time. It can make it affordable, but you know that because they're part of this alliance, maybe they have a little bit of groundsman training. They've worked with some other climbing arborists. 
Um, they know how to use the rig and get somebody down, that kind of thing, just to make it all a little bit safer and kind of raise the level we have instead of, like you said, working so independently where it's like, I do this, it's all about me. Like, why reinvent the wheel all the time when we could, when we could work together and in a yeah. way collaborate yep. like this? Totally. And then it'd also yeah. be a yep. hub for, for arborists like me. It's already a business to go to this alliance, this Facebook group, whatever it, whatever it is, and maybe find a climbing arborist and say, hey, I got a job next week. My normal guy can't come. And then you know you have a sort of half-decent guy that's going to show up as trusted by other, maybe you leave reviews about, of this guy on this, on this mm-hmm. thing. You know what I mean? Like, all this stuff exists. Someone just got to put it together. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's it's there's a lot of merit in what you're talking about. And, and I've thrown this this you know concept around with a few folks in conversation. And and I think the there's a ton of merit in it. The challenge is actually executing it appropriately, right? I mean, there's always and again, I'm not trying to put anybody down, but there's always folks out there that will take shortcuts to make the dollar, right? And, and that's the challenge to it. And so you create this environment where you have an alliance of climbing arborists that are contractors that can come in and solve your problem. And we agree to certain sort of practices, certain, you know, best work practices, stuff like that. There's always going to be somebody that comes in and goes, well, I can do it for half that price and half that time. Right. And so it's the challenge is how to you. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't go that direction because mm-hmm. I think we should. And it's something that I'd love to do. But the challenge is always going to be how do you how do you create the professionalism, right? How do you create the desire in the small tree care companies to pursue the professional alliance that has the best work practice and all these things? Where I could actually bring in this guy and he'll get it done. It whatever. Like I don't necessarily know the difference, but it gets done. But I make a little bit more because he doesn't charge me as much, right? So there's there's always this ongoing battle about how do you how do you move forward uh for sure that doesn't mean again that doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything because standing back and saying you know oh this is never going to change we should just it's like no that's like you you do that and it is never going to change you got to start somewhere you got to push something yeah uh, and so it's it's definitely something that i would love to pursue uh and and just some of that knowledge sharing, right? And even around like, hey, I got a green crew. I'm going to incorporate this basal anchor that's lowerable. Let's talk about that. And, you know, maybe you agree that that's the way forward so that, you know, if I do get into trouble and I'm in a trapped and pinned situation, I've got these basics established because of our alliance's work practices that I'm four blocks down. Maybe you call the alliance and I'm like, oh, crap. I can jump in my truck, zip over and help affect a rescue or do whatever, right? Like having that sort of network available to you as well. There's all sorts of merit in that as well. But uh, yeah, it's something that uh, I definitely see value in. Uh, and like I say, I mean, there's there's always going to be challenges, but if we don't start somewhere, nothing's going to change, right? So. Yeah, definitely. I have to remind myself that all the time too. Yeah. Um, there's always people that don't want to do it, right? And I'm learning all this with that much. There's yeah. always people that don't think it matters. They don't believe in it. Yeah. Uh, they think it's a dumb idea or they're they're jealous that they didn't do it first or whatever it might be. And, you know, yeah. and it's like, that's fine. Like, I, I get it. But, like, I'm going to focus on what I'm doing, what I know is right, what I'm trying to do to make change. And that's just my little piece. That's my little piece of the puzzle of, you know, the global everyone together whatever it's how i i feel like my life purpose aligns and i'm gonna stay true to that and create positive influence where i can and then hopefully Mm -hmm. through the journey like this podcast and things like that we can slowly change the mindsets of people give them another perspective to think about things how they're doing things and i think again getting back to our tree analogy that's like the root that's the root of all of it right because there's always going to be those totally climbing our wrists are like I can just do it for cheaper or these companies that are just going to, you know, quote, low ball or get the cheapest guy to do it. But I think that's it's going to come around full circle like like karma. It's going to get you if you're always underbidding, you know, maybe you're not going to be able to stay in business for a long time. You know, maybe someone's going to get hurt because they're not following some of our, you know, things we talked about with uh, safety or having things in place and realizing the what was it like the trends and tendencies you were talking yeah. about that create yep. a lot of these issues, right? So yep. we're trying to capture people right now, wherever they're at, 
you know, hopefully with all different mindsets and perspectives and give them something to think about that they can chew on to get better. And I think if people are in that locked mindset of they don't care, they don't want to get better, you know, they're, they're asleep essentially and they just, they just haven't made it there yet. Yeah. And ultimately, I think life in general will guide them to improve. Everyone generally tries to do their best and get better and ultimately just wants to be happy. <laughs> so I would hope that totally. if someone out there wanted to start something like this, I don't think it could be bad at all. I think it would, it may make some no, good change yeah. and it may all make change with yeah. certain people and you could feel it out and see where it goes and what kind of network this could build. Um, maybe it spawns something else completely off or different, but it would have to start with that, with that step. You know, I don't know if this, this makes sense. I th- I'm thinking so broadly now and most sure. no. all the time, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, the definition of insanity is doing the exact same thing over and over and over again, expecting uh, a different outcome, right? That's why. And it's, I hate it's monotony. Uh, man, like it's, we've been competing in the service industry, not even just our board culture, but in the service industry, we've been competing. That's all we do. We're doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting that this time it's different. This time I'm going to make it, or this company's going to be successful. And how many small companies do you see going bankrupt or going out of business within one, two years because they're dropping the bottom line to get all of the competition, right? Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, we keep doing the same darn thing, expecting a different outcome. So you, you got to try something different, right? Got to try something different. And maybe the Alliance is not necessarily the best way to do it, but yeah, no, that's it's just something an idea. different and it's something to try. So, that's just yeah, an idea. 100%. I mean, like, because yep. I think why not, like, why do we have to look so externally to, like, some organization of somebody else doing it? This is just an entrepreneurial mindset, but, like, oh, the ISA, like, they're going to take care of it. They'll develop this. And if they don't have these yeah. programs, then whatever. But it's like, what, what is the ISA badge on your, on your truck? It's just something that someone created and created a list of, uh, you know, like a test that you had to pass and then whatever. And then they provide this. It's like, you can just create your own thing. That's like, what's what I'm doing with Amos tree. Mm-hmm. Like there's no, there's no yeah, like man. ruler of the world that says you have to be this person or you have to do this and have these credentials before you can go out and start your own arborist contract climber Alliance to try and make the industry yeah. better. Yeah. It's like, no, you can do it. You can do it now. You can just get up and start throwing some ideas down. You can, write me happy to brainstorm that's one of my strengths is just coming up with ideas and brainstorming and uh maybe put something together yeah man you know i don't know do you have any other ideas of uh you know the industry i guess the industry in general or contract climbing like do you do you have any other ideas of how things could be done differently or better or any foreseeable changes in the future (laughs) yeah i mean it's it's Honestly, I, I, I think the biggest thing for me is, is the recognition or the recognition rather, wow, recognition, recognition of, <laughs> of some of the areas in which we can increase safety. I mean, it's, it's, we've talked about this. The reality is this is one of the most dangerous things we can do for money is working with trees, running chainsaws, chippers, climbing, all these types of things. Uh, it's one of the most dangerous things we can do for money. And we tend to look towards safe practices until all of a sudden we're the contract climber up there by ourselves and we kind of just ignore all of that and like no no put the blinders on don't worry about it uh, and so I think that's you know there's a lot of room to increase the safety aspect of contract climbing and it's you know I we've speculated on a few different things as far as climbing systems and how you're going to configure your systems but they all have holes in them None of them are bulletproof. None of them are the silver bullet that's going to solve the problem. Uh, and I think ultimately the best you can do is to have somebody available to come get you. And so whatever that looks like in a contract climbing environment, whether it's through this creation of an alliance that you have folks nearby, I don't know where it'll go, but I think that's the biggest thing uh, is developing work practices that will make sure that we're as safe as we can be creating you know rescue plans whatever the case may be uh a lot of it might even just come down to documentation right yeah you show up on site make sure you got the documentation you don't just roll in and start cutting sort of thing uh yeah i think that's the biggest sort of um i don't want to call it a challenge but the biggest thing to kind of focus on is how can we improve some of the safety in the tree care industry period uh but specifically around contract climbing when you're essentially kind of by yourself right and that's the reality of it. You so know, 
this reminds me of firefighting and training. And yeah. I, I yeah. saw the evolution of the RIT teams coming in. Yeah. Because uh, I remember doing it without that. But it came as a result of all of these people dying as firefighters going into buildings and um you know what you know of course they're in a group they're always in a team no one's by themselves which is unique to boar culture too that you are by yourself up there doing you're in the action right yeah but even then they would get they would go in and even though they are a team they're still together in the action and then if you have any problems it was like well who's going to come get you like everyone has a task like there's guys running ropes there's there's somebody else uh, cutting up the cutting up the wood and feeding the chipper and like they all have their tasks. Well, who's tasked to be your second set of eyes to look there after go. what you to be ready to rescue you if something happened? And I, don't, and I know like a boar culture isn't as dangerous as say going into a building for that acute moment in firefighting. Of course, there's some extreme dangers there at that moment. So you need I agree with a RIT team. And if you don't, if people don't sure. know what a RIT team is, it's like a couple guys with a, a special kit of. Uh, breathing apparatus and a mask and maybe some tools that their their sole purpose is to track and monitor where you are in the building and be ready to go in and uh, perform a rescue and help you get yep. out if if yep. required right so but a boar culture is still dangerous and like you said like statistically it's like one of the most dangerous professions i think it's more dangerous than firefighting way more dangerous statistically than of course statistically. not just yep. we're not isolating yep. down just that moment of an actual structure fire or whatever but yep um, it just brings me back to this, and I'm not saying this is what we have to do or whatever, but this idea of maybe you shouldn't be by yourself doing contract climbing. Like maybe we should rethink from a broader perspective how we're approaching it overall. Like mm -hmm, I'm not mm -hmm. encouraging we bring in regulation. I hate regulations and rules because they're so black and white in a, in a gray world. But um, what do you think about that? Like maybe down the road in the future, maybe 20 years, we're just we're outside looking in here now like, do you think there would be benefit to say limiting or not allowing a contract climber to come in that doesn't know the crew be independent and go in there and perform work without somebody else? Like they need to be a team. They need to have someone, yeah, a trained grounds person. Yeah. Well, and I think it's, it's, um, I mean, interesting concept with regulation and, and being black and white in a gray world. I think there's, there's room for best practice. There's room for guidelines. There's room for recommendations. There's room for these types of things. Uh, without writing that down and publishing stuff like that, you're never going to get traction, right? I mean, it's it's inevitably, and, and to relate it back to the fire service, uh, the fire service has a set of recommendations. It's called the NFPA, National Fire Protection Association. They publish all sorts of standards, they call them, on apparatus, what needs to be on an apparatus, how, what classifies it as a fire apparatus, you know, requirements for physical fitness, requirements for breathing apparatus, requirements for bunker gear, for all these different things, writ requirements. If I'm going in, I need a writ, all this type of stuff. Right. They publish all this, but inevitably it's all recommendations. You yep. don't have to follow it. Yep. You may have local legislation that says you must follow these bits of the NFPA, but at the end of the day, it's just an organization. It's an association that published recommendations. And the industry started to pick up on it, and it's creating change. And I think that's the big piece. Yep. You know, you, you can't I, – I do not – I agree with you completely. I don't think you can put in a regulation because inevitably in an environment such as ours, there are always – there's always times when you cannot meet whatever the regulation says. It's black and white in a gray world. But publish recommendations. Publish things that are best practices that people yep. can start to refer to. And there may be zero traction off the hop. But the longer they're out there and the more they get talked about and the more they get incorporated into certain folks' working practices, the more traction they're going to get. And that's how you start to affect a little bit of change. Do you think does this exist anywhere already? Because I'm probably ignorant to the intricacies of what the TCIA offers, mm -hmm. you know, the ISA offers. I'm yep. sure this might even be on their radars. There's even groups out there that I'm not really familiar with, but like this, uh, like the High Climbers Brotherhood on Facebook. Yeah. Like, is that yep. just a bunch of dudes that share a Facebook group and chat and and make hoodies? Or, or no. is like, is there no, some sort of uh, something? Yeah being created there like maybe totally. like that's where it yep. starts you know like yep. yeah and there's certainly folks out there doing it right tcia you mean isa to extent is doing it uh 
there's a big one actually there's a a a group of climbers in bc in canada here that's pushing towards some form of tiered climbing education right so you know class one climber or at and I apologize to those folks if I'm calling it the wrong thing, but you've got like your tier one, your tier two, and that unlocks some new skills. And they're trying to build it into more of an apprenticeship, the way another Red Seal trade would be, like plumbing or electrical or any of these other Red Seals. Uh, So there's certainly folks out there pushing for this change and pushing for this professionalization. Uh, Ultimately, I don't think there's any such thing as too much. I think anybody that wants to start and push some of this stuff, I think it's only beneficial because inevitably you're going to link together with other people, find those common grounds, find those area for collaboration. And now all of a sudden these start to do this. And all of a sudden you end up with one or two paths that is really catching on and really kind of making awesome change. Uh, it's got to start at the grassroots, right? And, and yeah. so there's folks out there doing it and, and, you know, I, I love to see it and I want to support that and I want to get involved where I can. So, uh, from a minute standpoint, from an actual acute standpoint of you as an individual contract climbing arborist, uh, have those conversations with the person that's contracting you. Right. And we've talked about communication, be upfront and honest. If you're coming in to do something super technical, super crazy, big, crazy rigging, stuff like that, have the conversation early and just point out the risks that are involved and why this is such a risky activity, right? Answer the question why, and then push for that. Say, hey, you know what? This is a situation where there's a lot of risk. These are big limbs. There's a lot of weight to it. I have to do some pretty elaborate rigging. I have to put some small limbs into compression in order to do this. The consequences are high. You know, explain your way through it and, and, Maybe that's the job where you you shed 10 bucks off your hourly wage or whatever in order to articulate. I'm going to shed 10 bucks off my wage. If you could chip in 10 bucks or 15 bucks from you, so I'll increase the overall hourly weight a little bit so that I can bring in this trusted grounds person or this mentor, or this other person that I work pretty closely with in order to make sure that A, we're safe, but B, we're able to do the actual technical rigging that we need to solve your problem. Right. Uh, that's a way to go about it from a, an acute standpoint. And if they know that up front, then solve that. they probably already aware that this job is highly technical, which totally. means it's going to cost lots Why of they money. Called you, right? And I'm sure the customer so. understands that as well or will if they're yep. educated on this. So again, all the way back to communication and yep. being upfront about this. And then they can just put that cost into their bill. So they're not even worried about that. It's costing them any more money, you know, totally. and let, or yep. they have to go back to their client, whatever that's, but that's on them. That's how they run their business. So ultimately, I think what we're trying to say to everybody out there is like, you have to be able to think for yourself, police yourself, and not yeah. necessarily at this point rely or never should probably rely on any external um, organization to tell you what to do. Those are all guidelines. And if they don't Bingo. exist yet, maybe you need to put together your own set of guidelines. Think yep. outside the box. Make sure this stuff is in place because we're not, we don't have this alliance here to tell us you have to have a groundsman with you all the time. Like maybe one day, maybe one day, like all contract climbers everywhere will be regulated through, you know, maybe the ISA will expand and have a whole program and that's just becomes regulation everywhere. And you have to have a trained rescue groundsman with you and that'll be yeah. normal. But like that's this yeah. evolution, you know, starts in these places of people talking about it. So, I mean, I'm, maybe this podcast even will get someone thinking Yep. get somebody to get up and start doing this or give them some ideas of how to change something that's already in place. And, uh, you know, we're part of the route. They're trying to, trying to make yep. change, but yeah. And, and I mean, uh, to clarify, some of that does exist. There is, you know, recommendations and guidelines and best practices and standards yeah. that state that you're supposed course, like, to have somebody on the ground with kit ready to go that can affect a rescue that's written out there. Uh, ANSI has got stuff published for that. Like it's, it's there. Right. The the point I think we're trying to make is is in a contract climbing environment, we tend to be okay with putting on the blinders and getting away from some of those standards and recommendations. And right or wrong, we can have that conversation. Should we? No, we shouldn't. We should always have somebody that can affect a rescue. That's the reality. It's written down. We should follow it as well. But the reality is in the contract climbing world, we tend to put on the blinders and kind of ignore that. Mm-hmm. And and it's this it's this difficult situation because we want to be 
the pinnacle of the industry. We want to be preaching best practices. We want to be doing all these things. And then all of a sudden we strap on the contract climbing banner and we ignore some of that. And so that's where that communication comes from with your the people that are contracting you, right? Explain, educate, explain why. Push some of these standards or push towards whatever safety protocols you need to put in place to make sure that you have the ability to affect rescue or be rescued. Uh, and that's that's the big one. It's out there. It's published. We just tend to look the other way. And it's it's I think the biggest thing you can do is become an advocate for it, uh, both as a small tree care company, obviously, uh, but as a contract climber as well. Start pushing that. Start pushing towards the best practices that are out there already. And let's start to develop more. Right. Let's... Yeah. hundred percent. And I mean, there's probably people out there screaming right now, like, oh, this exists. This is all right here. Like we already do 100%. this or yep. something. Totally. We get it. But we're just we're proving to you right now that at where we are at in our industries, which I think is above average, you know, being assistant instructors, trying to abide by these guidelines, but we're still working in our communities and in Alberta, it's kind of a mm -hmm. wild west here. There's not a lot of regulation. There's not an approved totally. apprenticeship. So we're all aware and connected through social media and whatever that there's different standards everywhere, but trees are trees in general. So it's like, well, if that guy, if I don't have to do it over here in Alberta, then why should I, you know, just mm -hmm. because that guy has to go through that training and that apprenticeship over there. Yeah. So we have to change that mindset. And yes, if those things do exist, for one, share them. And if you're new and getting into this and you think, well, I don't know what to do. Like I, I kind of need to start out by following some of these protocols uh, with that training, you know, just how to do it to get going before you can start to understand the whys and thinking outside the box. Like, yes, definitely go look up um, these ANSI guidelines and mm -hmm. go look at the best or safe and best work practices that the ISA releases. Um, figure out yep. what the ISA has, what's available, what's, what's available from the TCIA, what's what's available from other people like besides me and you out there that have uh, an audience in the boriculture industry that are trying to share good safe work practices and, and put this together and then start filling out your own, uh, your own way to approach all of this. Bingo. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. ANSI Z 133 uh, is a big one, right? That kind of dictates all of the things that we should be doing uh, with our boriculture operations. Uh, yeah, yeah, ISA has got a bunch of stuff published. TCIA has got a bunch of stuff on their website. WorkSafe BC has actually published some like stuff specific to climbing. Uh, the idea of having a climbing plan, a documented climbing plan, looking at the risks. There's best practices document. It's a it's a one page front and back. There's a lot of, of opportunity to expand that, but there's stuff out there. Yeah, uh, find it if you want help feel free to reach out i have all of these things as pdfs because i'm kind of the nerd from that regard i can send it to you we can have conversations about it i can point you in the right direction uh, there's stuff out there it's just a matter of building those conversations and building that professionalism through communication and that's what it comes down to we need to stop putting the blinders on and saying hey you know what this is the environment we work in where I'm just going to ah, be by myself. It's worked for me in the past. Stop putting on the blinders and start, you know, pushing towards safe work practices and pushing towards that professionalism. So, yeah, that's great, man. Okay. Well, we should probably wrap it up, but if yeah, anyone, I got a four year old uh... calling my name, <laughs> so this, yeah. is, this is perfect my timing. <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So if anyone has any other ideas or wants to expand on a, a lot of the stuff we talked about, definitely reach out, uh, you know, like subscribe and all that crap. Yep. Uh, maybe leave some comments. So we get some conversation going, uh, below the video. This love is to. podcast is on YouTube. So it's a great place to start up some conversations there. I love looking at the, uh, the funny, ridiculous comments people leave on YouTube. So <laughs> feel free to, I haven't looked at any in. of them yet. Are they oh, good man, ones? YouTube in general, just comments, Yo, not, totally, not on these yeah. podcasts. Yeah. Okay. You know, yet, enough. but like on popular YouTube oh, it'll channels, get there. it'll get there. People just, you'll be a popular it's a, it's YouTube a thing. channel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one day. You got you got a million subscribers. I I feel it. A million? Oh my god! Yeah, right. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think the Arborist community is that. I have to change the name to like, maybe you know, Human Blueprint or something. There you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's about it, though. I'm Kurt the Arborist. You can find me. Uh, that's kind of my hub on Instagram. Kurt the Arborist. K U R T. Uh, at Rocky Mountain Arb. Or no, Rocky Mountain Arborist. Rocky Mountain Arborist, yep, on the Instagrams, on the socials. On the Instagrams, check us out there. Yeah. You can always reach out. So Love it. I think that's it, man. Appreciate cool, you brother. coming out for this three-part series. That was huge. It's been a blast. I don't, I don't know it. how they, Thanks for having me. They all ended up like two hours, 20 minutes. 
like that's, that's perfect that's great yeah. good content man I good hope conversations we helped, i hope we helped some people with something gave somebody a new idea created some sort of positive change and influence that means a lot to me that's ultimately why i'm doing this i know it's why you do a lot of stuff that you do so totally yeah if you 100%. feel inclined please share that experience uh with us because i i love to hear that feedback i want to know that what i'm doing and what you're doing sean is uh is good so yeah please give us some feedback we appreciate that Bingo. love you all okay take care See take ya. care thank you <laughs>